So good afternoon. Good morning to the others. On behalf of the Solutions Plus team, my name is Sarah Arrojado and I'm from Pasig Transport, the transport office of the Pasig City Government working on sustainable transport initiatives. I am pleased to welcome you all to the day four of the Pasig City training on e-mobility. This is the last day of our training and this is also co-organized with Cleaner Asia, which is a Solutions Plus consortium partner. So this session is run as a Zoom meeting, and so we will start off our session with basic to make you feel comfortable with the platform and share what's in store during our sessions. First off, please note that this session is being recorded. The recording and the presentations will be available afterward. We have muted everyone by default, so the session won't be accidentally disrupted. But when you want to talk later during the discussion, just click in the bottom bar to mute or unmute yourself. If you encounter any challenges on that, please just send a message to our host. This is a Zoom meeting and as opposed to a Zoom webinar, you can choose to have your camera on and off. However, to minimize disruptions, kindly switch it off in the meantime and we will have a question and answer later during which you can switch it back on. If you have any questions, just submit it via the chat box. You're welcome to use the chat box throughout for your comments and questions. We will have a dedicated time for questions later when we will address them. So the speakers are also going to refrain from answering you directly. So we won't have two simultaneous discussions both here and in the chat box. And to ease our discussions later, uh, can we ask you to rename yourselves? So starting off with your Zoom handle with your name and then your affiliation. We see this in aiding us in knowing where the questions are coming from in the chat box. And lastly, this session is going to be bilingual as we foster a welcoming environment for discussions. So feel free to speak and ask questions in Tagalog. So for the outlook for the week, this is the last day of our training. So for the past four days, starting in November, on November 9, we talked about the operation and maintenance of EVs, where we discussed the basics of an e vehicle. So this included a live demo by Tojo Motors, which showed the different parts of an e vehicle and its basic care and maintenance. Next, on the second day, we focused on policies, where we discussed the policy tools for local authorities in several cities the ASEAN EV standards and guidelines, as well as case studies of regulations in Malaysia and in India, culminating with the Philippine case with the newly issued LTO administrative order on e vehicles. In the next session, the focus was on the basics of EV charging and charging infrastructure, where different dimensions, including the technical, regulatory, and operational aspects of EV charging and the associated charging networks were discussed. <clears throat> and today is the last day of the training where we will talk about e-mobility transition at the city level. So thank you all for being here today and also to those who have attended the previous sessions. Our agenda today, we will be discussing the e-mobility at the city, e-mobility transition at the city level. The goal of this session is to support the decision makers and to serve as a platform for both the local and the national government in initiating discussions on community strategy development for e-mobility transition. Here we will talk about how the EV transition will benefit public transport operators and how it can help with their livelihood, the different government programs available for public transport operators and drivers if they would like to shift to using e-mobility vehicles, as well as the common myths and misconceptions about e-mobility that need to be dispelled. How can we effectively communicate the benefits of e-mobility in terms of livelihood and also in the areas of health and the environment? So these topics will be tackled in the presentations today by the speakers you see on your screen. Start, let's have a bit of an interaction Okay, so to start, which sector are you from? Are you from the local government, the national government, from an NGO, or the academe perhaps? Do we also have participants from 
the private sector here with businesses. Now I'm glad that a lot of participants today are coming from the private sector as well. Okay, so maybe we can move on to the next question. Do you own or operate an EV? So majority of our participants do not own an EV at the moment, but they would want to buy an EV. And a few are still skeptical about EV vehicles. So later we will have a discussion about dispelling some misconceptions about EV vehicles that hopefully can convince you to shifting to e-mobility. And almost a third of our participants own an EV. Next question, what are your main concerns about EV vehicles? So you can just type in your answers there. Now we see some answers regarding price, that it's expensive, the parking, the upfront cost, the mileage, and in terms of battery, the disposal of damaged batteries. And then there's also the after sales service. Oh, well, there's also the reliability of brands. There are quite a few brands already in the country. And I think we'll just see an increase of it as e-mobility picks up. Okay, so I think that's it. We will discuss these your concerns later during the discussions. You can also bring it up during our question and answer later in our session. Okay, so just to introduce myself again, I am Sara Arojado and I am an environmental transport planner at the city government of Pasig under the Pasig Transport Office, specializing in sustainable mobility, and I'm also working on e-mobility in the city, including the Solutions Plus project. So later, we will be joined by Anton C., the head of Pasig Transport Office in our Q&A session. So for those who are new today, Solutions Plus is a consortium of over 50 partners and associated and support partners, and is supported by the European Union. PASIG is a part of this consortium as a city partner, where other cities include Kathmandu, Hanoi, and Nanjing in Asia. The project involves coming up with innovative business models, vehicles, services, policies, and operations that help boost all types of electric mobility. So for the first part, I will be presenting the development of an emissions inventory in PASIG. So we did this together with Cleaner Asia, who helped us in having a hands-on approach in EI through a workshop conducted last July. This is one of the steps needed in the air quality management, and it also feeds into the e-mobility roadmap of PASI. So with the help of Cleaner Asia, we are using this guidance framework which shows the components of air quality management to develop a knowledge base, which includes the level and sources of pollution as well as its impact. The aim is to lead the solutions in the form of policies, frameworks, and measures that national and local governments and even individuals can formulate and apply. And in turn, these policies and frameworks can be institutionalized through cleaner action plans. Next. So what is an emissions inventory? So we conducted this as part of PASIG's e-mobility roadmap, and it is a comprehensive listing of amounts of air pollutants emitted by various sources in an area during a specific period that can be used to identify the most important sources and options for control. So it is location and time-based. The emissions inventory is the basic building block of air quality modeling and acts as an integral part of air quality management. Next. In the context of PASIG, we looked into all the mobile sources of pollution within the city, how emissions are emitted, where they are emitted, and when they were emitted. Next slide. So what is the role of the emissions inventory in air quality management. In PASI, this is extremely helpful in determining the areas where pollution is concentrated in the city. 
The results of the EI provide a list of sources of air pollutants and their emission levels. It can also help us determine the exposure of a population to air pollution when coupled with air quality modeling. The EI development is just the first step, and data from this can be combined with other factors such as meteorological data conditions, health incidence rates, and other data. These information contribute in the air quality management in the city. So with the EI, we can determine the sources of air pollution per barangay, and then from there, we can strategize to address specific pollutants on the result. These will all feed into the e-mobility roadmap and eventually into the cleaner action plan for the city. Next. So there are two approaches to the emissions inventory. There is the bottom-up and then the top-down approach. So it's the estimation of emissions using specific data and using available general data. For passive, we focus on the bottom-up approach first, dealing with the mobile sources of data. Next. This is just the EI process that we conducted in PASIG. Uh, an activity data template, which is an Excel file. And we were assigned barangays and a specific road segment to work on. So next we used Google Maps and we just selected the starting and destination point of our assigned road segment. And then next we encoded the road segment details on the template. So this also includes the date of extraction, the trip duration, and the type of vehicle share. Next, and then in Google Maps, you can get the historical traffic data by selecting specific dates in the calendar. You can see that option under the Leave Now button to get the historical traffic data. Then next, we just took snapshots of the road so we could perform a vehicle count on our assigned segment. And then after that, we just encoded the data under the type of vehicle share where the annual vehicle kilometers are automatically calculated. And lastly, the results are included in another sheet in the results summary where the activity data for public transport are derived from our existing data, which includes the fleet size and the route. So next, Dana from Clean Air Asia will discuss the results and outcomes from the emissions inventory process in PASIG. Just to introduce our next speaker, she is Dana Babella from Clean Air Asia. So she is provides technical assistance to air quality management projects and supports related capacity building activities of Clean Air Asia. She is a licensed chemist with a bachelor's and master's degree in chemistry from UP Diliman. And her graduate research work was primarily focused on particulate matter and aerosol studies. And prior to Clean Air Asia, she was a college chemistry laboratory instructor and a university research associate for almost eight years at the UP Diliman. So welcome, Dana, and the floor is yours. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So today I will be presenting on the preliminary results of the Pacific City Emissions Inventory. So as mentioned by uh, Ms. Sarah, uh, the EI for Pacific City focuses uh, specifically on the mobile sources only. So this is the outline of my presentation. So I will, I will be discussing a short uh, introduction again and recap on what is an EI, the scope of the EI for Pasig City, the methodology and assumptions that were made, uh, and then what are the preliminary outcomes of the study and the key takeaways. So uh, for more references also on the emissions inventory development, I have included uh, here below a link which will lead you to a learning web portal handled by Clean Air Asia under the Integrated Program for Better Air Quality in Asia. So uh, if you click this link, uh, or if you go to this link, uh, it will lead you to a site that gives you more learning materials for on emissions inventory and modeling. So for the introduction and recap, so I think uh, I'll just go over this quickly since Sarah already discussed this. 
So again, the EI is a comprehensive listing of amounts of air pollutants emitted by various sources in a geographic area during a specific, specific period of time. So that is specific. We have a specific area and a specific period. So we have to know from what date is the emission inventory uh, developed from or what data from what uh, what period were the data collected used to develop the EI, uh, we need to know that information. And then uh, the, the determination of uh, sources which uh, can lead to targeted action. So this is also mentioned by Sarah. So uh, we know that from the EI, it will give us a list of where, uh, what, where are the uh, pollutants, uh, which areas in the city uh, have higher levels of specific pollutant uh, emissions, so we can use this to uh, deem to have targeted actions. And then, in the EI, the sources covered usually include point, area, and mobile sources. So, uh, but again, for passive, we only focus on the mobile sources. And also in an EI, the more sources we have, or the higher the activity that is being observed, the higher or the emissions will be. And then if we have higher emission factors, which we will be discussing later, there will be higher emissions as well. And during the development of an EI, uh, absence of an activity data does not equate to no emission. So th these are some of the things that we have to keep in mind in developing an EI. So the development of an EI for PASIG was made possible through the City Switch to E-Mobility project. So this is a project supported by the UPS Foundation, and this is a three-year program to develop clean air action plans focusing on delivering e-mobility solutions for the city. So the project goal is to protect public health from the impacts of transport emissions by mainstreaming sustainable electric mobility solutions in Pasig City's clean air uh, initiatives. So the EI development is part of the baselining activities, and it, uh, the EI results will provide information and will spatially map major emission sources. So these can help in identifying control measures and can help us strategize in how to address them. So uh, the following flow chart here shown below shows the overview of the EI process in this project. So we, had, we did data collection, we did scoping, and then we also had a uh, EI training and co-development with Pasig City Departments CTDMO and CENRO. And then uh, all of these are used to develop the baseline assessment report, which will then feed into the development of the e-mobility roadmap for Pasig City. Okay, so for the scope methodology and assumptions, so the scoping helps us identify the coverage of the EI. So for this project, the geographical boundary is limited to the area of Pasig City. And then the period or base year use for this uh, EI is 2019, since it was the latest year uh, pre-pandemic. So this will help determine baseline emission values during what we may call the normal conditions, not the new normal, which we assume to, to happen once the pandemic is over. So this is also to avoid underestimation of emissions level. So we will be using uh, 29, well, we used 2019 as our base year. And then table one here on your left shows what vehicle sources and pollutants were covered in the EI. So these include the private vehicles, passenger cars, SUVs, and vans, uh, motorcycles. And then for public transportation, we have buses, minibuses, jeepneys, utility vehicles or UV Express, taxis, tricycles, and freight, uh, which include like commercial vehicles, trucks, and trailers. And then for the pollutants covered, uh, we have uh, particulate matter uh, with aerodynamic diameter of less than 10 micrometers and less than 2.5 micrometers, or better known as PM10 and PM2.5. We also have black carbon, carbon monoxide, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, non-methane volatile organic compounds, or NM NMVOCs, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrous oxide, and methane. So these are combinations of criteria pollutants uh, greenhouse gases, and what we call short-lived climate pollutants. So for the mobile emissions inventory for Pasig City, the general computational framework for emissions calculations is the following. So we have emissions is equal to emission factor times activity data. 
So emissions uh, emission factors are the amount of pollutants emitted per unit of emission source. So this this is this uh, value is usually obtained from literature or studies. So these are examples of EFs. Oh, so we uh, from this point we will be uh, abbreviating this to EF. So EF or emission factors. There are different types, and then we have different uh, sources here for where we can get these values. And then activity data, one part of the uh, equation, uh, include data derived from emission sources. So in this case, for our mobile sources, we are deriving vehicle kilometers traveled, or VKT. Or from what uh, Sarah showed earlier in the data template, we have annual vehicle kilometers. So that is the same, uh, VKT. And then uh, we will be deriving those, uh, we, I mean, we derive uh, the VKT from the collected data. And this was done by identifying significant roads and passage. So when we say significant, it means that there is a significant traffic or vehicular activity along those roads. And then these usually include the primary, secondary, national highway, uh, primary, secondary roads, and then national highways, and other roads that were deemed to have significant uh, activity as consulted with passive transport. And then to obtain the activity data for private vehicles, uh, vehicle flow analysis was performed. Uh, this was done through an alternative method using the Google Maps data extraction, which uh, Sarah has outlined earlier. And then for public uh, transportation, uh, uh, data such as fleet size, route maps, and route, uh, route lengths were used. Okay, so to, to quickly recap uh, what Ms. Sarah outlined earlier. So again, we had the following template that we used and selected representative dates of different seasons were, set, were chosen. So the three seasons, school, school uh, vacation, and Christmas season uh, were selected because these uh, were deemed to have different traffic profiles observed during each season. So for each barangay, the number of vehicle type passing through each uh, road segment. So for barangay, uh, the significant roads were identified. And then we did the data extraction for road segment. So for each uh, road segment, for each date, the vehicle type passing through uh, that road was determined. And then it was also the speed data was also estimated for each uh, road segment. So this was done first by obtaining the minimum and maximum travel time through a particular road segment using Google Maps. Uh, and this was uh, data for specific uh, par or particular hours during the day was also done. For example, travel times were obtained for each hour as shown here, if you can see the screen and my cursor. So from 5 a.m to 10 p.m. for major roads. And then for minor roads, we only sell, uh, extracted data from 6 to 8 a.m. and 5 to 7 p.m. And then from the extracted data, uh, speed data or bulk speed data for each hour was computed and using, um, was then computed using these data. And then uh, also using the length of the specific road segment that was selected for the Google Maps. So again, from the data ex Google Maps data extraction, we were able to obtain speed data, which we can use to calculate the annual vehicle uh, kilometers traveled by each uh, vehicle type. Okay. Uh, before I go to the next slide, uh, after the speed data, uh, after the speed data extraction, a manual vehicle count was done along five random points along the road. So Ms. Sarah also showed this earlier. Uh, along the road segment. So we use the random uh, vehicle, uh, random point vehicle count uh, to fill in the table here below. And then with that, uh, the annual VKT was uh, calculated per road segment. And then we, so, uh, we took the sum for the whole barangay. So in summary, uh, for the EI methodology for private vehicles, okay. Um, Using the bulk speed, the passenger car unit, so bulk speed in step one, passenger car units or PCU were derived using the speed PCU function, which was calibrated actually for Indian roads. So we have cited here the studies. And then a PCU or passenger count uh, uh, 
a car units is a uniform measure of vehicles used for converting traffic stream composed of two or more vehicle types into an equivalent traffic stream uh, composed of ex exclusively passenger cars. So after that, uh, using the following data and uh, uh, these were all incorporated within the Excel file. So it was easy to just uh, input the speed date the speed data or basically the minimum uh, time it takes to travel along the selected road segment and then using this uh, we were able to compute the vehicle team along with other uh, data such as vehicle share and then for the public transportation such as uh, specifically for the jeepneys uvs and buses uh, data were obtained from relevant Pasig City departments such as uh, Pasig Transport, oh, sorry, Pasig Transport and City Demo are the same. Uh, and then uh, these were used in calculation of the VKT per route and per barangay. And then the total VKT from uh, per barangay was obtained and this was done by manually obtaining route lengths per barangay using Google My, uh, My Map. So what we did, uh, we know the uh, a route map of each uh, of each uh, behind of jeepney or UV or bus, and then we plotted this in Google Maps, and then we manually measured the road length or the route route length per barangay. So we use this to estimate how much is the activity data for each vehicle type in for each road in a barangay. Okay, so the equation shown on the slide is, was used to obtain the emissions for jeepneys and buses. So it includes the round trip length, number of operating days in a year, emission factors, and the fleet size, and the number of trips or dispatches. So on ta the table four on your right shows the operational assumptions that were assumed to use this uh, equation. So the operating operational assumptions were based on uh as on the estimates of a jeepney sector analysis study that was done by department of transportation and in 2006 and then uh, for tricycles uh, data were again provided by relevant uh, Pasig city departments so city demo and toro and then assumptions include the distance traveled per day which was 65 kilometers as observed in a local study which was led by uh, one of our speakers today, so Dr. Manny Bayona. And then the equations shown on the slide here shows how the emissions were calculated from, uh, emissions of tricycles were calculated. So it, the, uh, the equation includes the distance traveled per day, the number of operating days in a year, the tricycle fleet size in the barangay, and the tricycle emission factor. So for these, uh, for each uh, TODA, the fleet size was apportioned to the barangays according to the area of the Toda zone sh uh, shown on your left, uh, on your right, in each barangay. So this was done by importing KML files of the barangay delineation so, and tricycle zones in Google My Maps. And we manually determined the area of each Toda zone in each barangay. Okay. So after that, uh, since we're done at this point, we have now discussed the activity data in terms of VKT from the different vehicle types. So for the emission factors, liter literature values were locally adjusted. So EFs were adopted from a 2016 ENEP slash EAA guidebook. Uh, uh, the ref complete reference for this is listed uh, in the last slide. And then these were locally adjusted. So this was done through the use of vehicle variant shares. Uh, emission standards, fuel share, and fuel economy. So in the absence of official data, vehicle shares by fuel and uh, vehicle emission standards shown in table five were, were based on the local knowledge on the transport or vehicle fleet characteristics in the city or in the region and the professional judgments of the EI team. Uh, also uh, cons in consultation with Dr. Manny Bayona. And then Table six uh, shows figures derived from the same uh, reference, the 2016 uh, ENEP guidebook, and also based on the interviews, on previous interviews by the team of Dr. Manny Bayona. 
So for the emission uh, factors, so table seven shows the adjusted emission factors by vehicle type. So the, uh, in the unit gram per kilometer. And uh, so now we have the activity data. We already know our emission factors. When we multiply them, we will get the emissions per pollutant. So first, so now we can go to the preliminary results. So for the results, the figure, the big figure, the graph, um, shows the emission shares by barangay. So as shown on the uh, figure, it notice that uh, barangay Ugong had the highest emissions of all species that were considered in the inventory. So contributing to more than 50% of the total emissions for all species except for methane. So uh, this was mostly due to the number of the significant roads in the barangay, so for Ugong. And then for other barangays, uh, they were emissions were more or less evenly distributed except for Pinagbuhatan, which contributed more to NMDOCs. So again, this is, uh, this is non-methane volatile organic compounds and carbon monoxide and methane. So this was due to the consider considerable tricycle uh, fleet size operating within barangay, where in fact, uh, Pinagbuhatan, based on the data collected, had uh, a tricycle fleet size at 2,243 units. So for the whole of Pasig City, just a quick uh, note also, the major pollutant or the, or the pollutant with the highest emission levels uh, based on the preliminary results was carbon dioxide and this was followed by carbon monoxide. So both of these are a uh, product of combustion. So next, for the next slide, so this figure now shows the emission shares by each vehicle type in passing. So in the previous slide, we know which pollutant is the major pollutant in the city, which barangay had the highest level of emissions. So now we will go to which vehicle type is uh, the major contributor for each pollutant. So I have here listed down uh, what the following um, abbreviations mean. So just to summarize, major contributors per pollutant for NMDOC, we have tricycles and motorcycles. For carbon, mon for carbon monoxide, we have passenger cars and SUV or vans. And then for nitrogen oxides, trucks, and then we also have SUV and vans again. For the particulate matter, we have uh, for both PM10 and PM2.5, we again, SUV and vans are the major contributors. Uh, same thing for sulfur oxides. And then for methane, we have tricycles and motorcycles. And then for nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and black carbon, uh, SUV and vans also contribute to those. And uh, along with passenger cars for nitrous oxide, trucks for CO2, and, um, again, and for black carbon SUV and vans again. So again, to summarize this slide, major contributors to emissions in the city include tricycle, motorcycles, passenger cars, SUV and vans, and trucks. Okay, so, so now we will go to the, uh, these figures. Will The next few figures will be showing the geographical distribution of the emissions within the city. So we have here the legend, the darker the color is, the more uh, higher the level of emissions are. So the maps shown here are also overlaid with locations of vulnerable sectors, such as health facilities and schools. So we chose health facilities because uh, people who usually go there or people who stay in the hospital are, have uh, compromised health. And also we chose schools because that is where uh, the younger uh, population tend to uh, tend to crowd or stay for longer uh, periods of time during the uh, pre-pandemic. Okay, uh, and then table nine also shows the population per barangay, where barangays with the highest uh, population are highlighted. So it is important to consider where the vulnerable sectors are because this will help us in decision making and prioritization of measures or policies to be implemented. So for this slide, I'm showing uh, the results for particulate matter. So notice that Barangay Ugong has the highest PM emissions for both. And then the, this is followed by San Nicolas, uh, Oranbo, and ba Bagong Ilog. So the, the main source of PM emissions in Ugong are SUV and vans, while for the three other uh, barangays, uh, the jeepneys are the major sources. 
So again, uh, using this map, we can uh, see which barangays have higher number of vulnerable sectors based on the legend. So we have health facilities as the red circle and schools as the uh, yellow square. So we notice that there are many around this area. So this will be helpful in the planning uh, for prioritization or for targeted action uh, to address uh, uh, these specific emissions or uh, emission sources. So for black carbon and nitrous oxide, on your left uh, is the summary for black carbon. So Ugong still had the highest BC emissions, which were mainly due to your SUV or vans and trucks. And then the second uh, uh, barangay with the highest emission was Oranbo, with emissions mostly coming from SUV and vans. And then for nitrous oxide, again, barangay Ugong had the highest emissions, uh, emission level, while the rest of the Barangays in Pasig were more or less evenly distributed, and for the other barangays, the major sources include SUV or vans, passenger cars, trucks, jeepneys, and light commercial vehicles. For nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides, again, Ugong had the highest emissions for both uh, pollutants. For nitrogen oxide on your left, Oranbo and Mangahan also uh, had high nitrous oxide emissions, mostly due to trucks, trailers, and jeepneys. While for your sulfur oxides, um, the emissions for the other barangays were, again, more or less evenly distributed. And major sources for these uh, were diesel vehicles, which include SUV or vans, uh, passenger cars, trucks, and light commercial vehicles. And then for the next set of pollutants, we have non-methane volatile organic compounds and methane. So for NMVOC, uh, Ugong again had the highest NMVOC emissions, which were mainly due to uh, SUVs or vans, motorcycles, and passenger cars. And then this was followed by Pinagbuhatan with emissions mostly coming from tricycles. So recall that um, Pinagbuhatan has quite a uh, big fleet size for the tricycles. So that's why we are seeing this trend. And then for methane, major sources of methane in, uh, Emissions are tricycles and motorcycles. So the barangays with the most number of these vehicles are Pinagbuhatan for tricycle and Ugong for motorcycle. So these were the two, uh, the two barangays which uh, generated the highest, uh, higher or highest emissions for methane. And then for carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, uh, Ugong was the Barangay with the highest level of emissions for both pollutants, which came from uh, passenger cars, SUV, and vans. And then for carbon monoxide, barangays Pinagbuhatan and San Nicolas also had high carbon monoxide emissions, mostly due to tricycles. While for, uh, for carbon dioxide, barangay Oranbo and barangay Bagong Ilog had high CO2 emissions, mostly due to jeepney. So that uh, concludes the part of the preliminary results. So we have key takeaways from the EI. So based on our preliminary uh, investigation, the res results show that Barangay Ugong had the highest emission of all species inventoried. Uh, this is mainly due to, again, the number of significant uh, roads within the barangay. And since it has uh, uh, a lot of significant roads, a lot of vehicles uh, fly the these roads, hence contributing more to the emission levels in Barangay Ugon. So again, as mentioned earlier, the more activity there is, the more, uh, the higher the emissions uh, that we will be obtaining. And then motorcycles and tricycles are significant sources of NMVOC, methane and carbon monoxide. Passenger cars also contribute significantly to NMVOC, CO and nit nitrous oxide. And then SUV and va and vans were significant sources of the following pollutants. So uh, they were the significant sources of quite a lot. And then diesel powered vehicles such as trucks, light commercial vehicles and jeepneys are also significant sources of nitro uh, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxide, uh, particulate matter, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and black carbon. So using this information, uh, the, cit the city, Pasig City can use this information to help develop uh, or formulate plans or policies or uh, recommendations to what can be done to address 
and have targeted uh, to address these uh, emission sources or um, uh, pollutants. And th this will help us also have targeted actions. It can help us uh, prioritize since uh, we know that uh, the, we have limited resources. So with this uh, information can help us prioritize which action to take. So I think uh, I will conclude uh, my presentation. So I have also attached here the references that were uh, used in the development of the EI. So I think uh, that is all. So Sarah. Thank you, Dana. So we saw an overview of the mobile emissions inventory process, how to calculate for the emissions for a given area, where we also saw how to conduct a vehicle flow analysis using Google Maps. It's good to know that we can get historical traffic data by just using Google Maps. For the results, it's interesting that despite being composed mostly of residential areas, Barangay Ugong still has the highest level of emissions, which is mainly due to the number of significant roads and also perhaps because of the number of vehicles that are owned by people living in those areas. For Pinagbuhatan, it has, a spe it has specific emissions due to the high number of tricycles. For the information of the others, Barangay Pinagbuhatan is the densest barangay in Pasig, and only tricycles are the form of public transport in the area. So this shows the need to shift to higher capacity vehicles for public transport that are also more sustainable. And then we also saw how carbon dioxide is the major source of pollution in Pasig. This just highlights the importance of pushing for more sustainable forms of transport, such as walking, cycling, and as well as shifting to e-mobility. So moving on to our next speaker. He is Kat De Matera of Clean Air Asia, and she leads the Sustainable Transport Program of Clean Air Asia where her work focuses on the areas of clean fuels and vehicles, fuel economy, low emission urban development, active transportation, green freight and logistics, and mobility. She was responsible for our partnership in PASIG for the launch of an electric mobility pilot in the city. And she also works closely with the DOE and the DTI for the development of regulations and policies to accelerate the uptake of electric mobility. So Kat, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you uh, to the organizers. Thank you, Sarah. And congratulations again to PASIG no, for the progress that it has been uh, making towards sustainable mobility and electric mobility. And as, as you have all seen, uh, LGUs are best placed and are able to have uh, a, a data-driven policy-making process. And we've seen how uh, such evidence or data can be used for, for policy reforms. So my presentation is actually going to be very brief. And if you have been joining us in the sessions, uh, you would observe that this somehow uh, tries to summarize or contextualize uh, those uh, into the Philippine setting. So we're going to look at LG role uh, in e-mobility transition. So it's important uh, uh, to understand first uh, that within and beyond the e-mobility and energy domains, there are various stakeholders. So these are normally coming from the government. Um, here, the government-owned and controlled corporation. Uh, we have EV users uh, and operators. We also have regulators and policymakers uh, who are uh, addressing uh, societal, uh, economic, and environmental aspects. And so we also need to identify during this process uh, of identifying the, the actors, you know, the drivers that are motivating the different stakeholders. So uh, we've seen uh, as many of our participants are coming from the government. We have some some from private sector. We also had uh, participation of uh, different CSOs now, uh, in the last few training days. Um, we will not dive much into uh, the different drivers reflecting the, the roles uh, and responsibilities, but we'll focus first on, on LG. Yeah? So to provide uh, a, a complete solution to the consumers, we need to look, uh, we need to somehow 
uh, facilitate this engagement, stakeholder engagement process. Now, so um, as you can see uh, in the screen, we also have the buildings and homes, those who are involved in property development, real estate. Uh, we also are going to be uh, working with uh, energy importers uh, who are involved, I mean, in regulating the energy uh, importation, uh, the federal prices, energy security. So all of these have, uh, all of these are our drivers, you know, some examples. Uh, also touching on the hazardous waste. So in the Philippines, we have a DNR on that. Um, and the other drivers include um, GHG emissions um, and the National Climate Goals or NDCs. Uh, at the local level, we are looking at urban air pollution, uh, improvement of local air quality, and improvement of public health. So those are just some uh, actors. All right. So, but first, an intro for those who are not familiar with the Philippine settings. I believe we have a couple uh, of participants who are joining us from uh, uh, from outside of the Philippines. So here uh, we have governments below the national government level, which as you would see, vary a bit from one another. So, but one message that we want to point out here after, after you've heard uh, Dana talk about the EI and, and Sarah, um, is that LGUs are best placed to determine measures from the ground up because of the presence of the barangay, so the, the smallest unit of govern, government system uh, in the Philippines. Um, so very briefly, um, the national government uh, need to provide, uh, generally, the national government agencies need to provide the enabling conditions and an environment uh, for electric mobility. And they have to be able to provide a, a level playing field for a healthy competition. So here's one uh, from one image. No? Uh, uh, from a study developed from 2019. So this is a de uh, Department of uh, Trade and Industry Sanction Study. And uh, that's also co-implemented uh, by five universities. So one of that uh, includes uh, uh, De La Salle University. So you'd hear from one of the key authors shortly. So the, the study recommends that an EV program for us should be anchored on addressing the core challenges uh, so that the program, the EV program would realize the potential benefits. So that includes what are the core challenges? So um, that includes demand generation, um, EV cost reduction, the industry development, and the charging uh, infrastructure development. So, so let's go through a bit uh, uh, quickly on uh, of the four pillars now. So uh, first, the demand generation. So some of these include uh, in a corporate EV fleet program. So the goal kasi for the demand generation is you want to create uh, the demand uh, of, uh, in industries operating the vehicle fleets. So um, considering the limitations in funding to subsidize you know, the vehicle adoption and purchase, so there has to be a combination of reg regulatory uh, and incentive approach. Um, and another uh, example for the demand generation uh, that the study is also suggesting is you know, um, introducing the minimum EV share in public transport modes. So in other countries, they're also do doing this. Um, in the Philippines, of course, we have to consider which are under the national government, which are under the, the local government. So, But they're one opportunity uh, that could be tapped. Uh, other things of uh, related to demand generation is uh, we know how governments would have their own fleets also. And the studies showed that there are about uh, 12,000 vehicles that are being purchased by the government agencies annually. So, so if there is a, uh, an opportunity here to uh, dictate that at least 10% of government uh, vehicles, uh, vehicle procurement, uh, be allotted to EVs at, uh, for a, a duration of time, that could be uh, one of the options. Uh, others, for example, um, the EV cost reduction, that would be like the importation tariff, the 
uh, excise taxes um, and other selective, selected uh, tax exemption. So um, in other cases, that's also related to the ECO, that could also be linked to the ECO PUV um, program of the, the Department of Trade and Industry. So they have a comprehensive automotive resurgence strategy or the CARS program. So some of you might be familiar with that already. So um, if that would be linked to the EV cost reduction, um, so that's also one of the recommendations. Uh, next, on the charging infrastructure development, um, that includes the EV charging point master plan, uh, charge infrastructure development incentive program, um, uh, formulation of charging power rates uh, and special charging, yeah, uh, charging power rates. So these are some of the recommendations that this study um, has provided. So, uh, but where does the local government uh, come in? So here we have our preliminary uh, notes on the, the agencies who are involved in these slides. So, so this is a preliminary mapping of instruments. No? So of course, this is subject to the review of different go local government agencies, uh, especially given the varying type of governance system that uh, they might have. Uh, but this is a, a diagram or an overview of various instruments that you have already heard in the last few sessions. So these are also opportunities in a way for transitioning passenger and goods movement uh, towards electrification. So um, I'll, I don't know if you're able to see the arrow that I have on the screen, but maybe I'll, I'll walk you through this. So the different instruments that are that could be taken are, this could be a framework that can be adopted. So uh, we have legislative or regulatory instrument, there are economic instruments, financial instruments. There are strategic uh, instruments or planning instruments. Um, uh, IEC, information and communication instruments, technological instruments and organizational instruments. So a lot of these, um, you know, some might say that, oh, these are actually under the national government, but what are the opportunities from the local government? So let's look at first the strat strategic or planning instrument. So these are the measures that focus on better planning of infrastructure. So uh, planning that helps optimize its tra transport, um, discovers both the public transport, um, the, the non-motorized transport, and like walking and cycling. So at the national level, there are a lot of strategic directions that can be provided. Um, let's say the industry development that we talked about earlier, the R&D, and that's of course linked to the funding, uh, public transport planning, uh, if, let's say for the buses and the railways uh, and power generation. So uh, the power generation and the direction on um, energy efficiency of transport sector. So DOE is providing oversight uh, on, on that area. Um, at the city level now on the strategic or planning, no? so there are a lot more uh, uh, opportunities for the smaller modes of EVs like three wheelers or e-trikes. So you've, you've, a lot of you have experience or are part of the DOE e-trike project before. A lot of LGUs um, have had a chance to pilot uh, EVs no? or e-trikes. Uh, some examples also include uh, infrastructure for light electric uh, vehicles, like personal mobility devices, um, electric kick scooters. So a lot of discussions are surrounding that. Um, and of course, walking and cycling. Land use uh, planning and city roadmaps are also led at the national, at the local level. Now, going to the econ economic instruments, um, this can help generate revenue for infrastructure funding, no? but these can also be used to influence behavior. So at the national level, um, commonly this could be in the form, these are in the form of the vehicle and, and fuel tax. So of course that's for the country's fiscal management. So MVUC, the motor vehicle users charge are also determined by uh, land transportation office on national level. Then uh, at the uh, city level, some examples um, include the parking pricing parking uh, management. So you've heard some examples in the last few days uh, of, um, you know, there could be local parking uh, restrictions or parking benefits for EVs like electric two and three wheelers could be prioritized, especially um, if yun yung kumbaga maraming ngayon. 
then we also have regulatory instruments. So these are implemented to discourage travel or if you want to deny access to certain vehicles. No? So very polluting subpar quality vehicles that are entering the Philippine market. So those are under then the regulatory instrument. Uh, at the national level, so ito nasa loob our national level. Eh. So at the national level, um, this could be in the form of uh, standards, as you heard on day two, uh, or charging protocols. Yeah? So um, uh, we talked a bit about standards to ensure product safety. Uh, we're also looking at emission standards um, and how does it connect. Um, later at the local level, you would see... Um, here, uh, this could be measures to, there could be measures to restrict the use of polluting vehicles. Um, priority of registration, uh, vehicle registration and renewal, issuance of private, uh, of plate license, uh, yeah, uh, license plate. Um, that's uh, usually at the national level. No? So, so Philippines, the LTO din yan. Um, at the city level, uh, authorities can implement measure to restrict certain types of vehicles in certain areas. So um, this is also where the baseline information or EI can direct us uh, which barangay or corridors are suffering or in, in kanina yung barangay ugang, di ba? which corridors are suffering from poor air quality. Um, but it's important to note here that uh, authorities must increase yung alternatives in parallel, so like increasing the ease of use of public transport or see how traffic is better reduced or managed for those who are you know, in private modes of transport. Another example, the low emission zones, now you also heard uh, about low emission zones uh, the other day. So these are areas where access is permitted only to vehicles or classes of vehicles that are meeting a prescribed uh, emission standard. And uh, one thing to, to note here then is that there should be enough supply already of uh, vehicles with clean tailpipe emissions and EVs. No? So otherwise, um, resistance may be felt um, if commuters are not able to use certain roads for utility purposes. No? So if there are, if there are, are if mara, mas naging um, leisure yung purpose no? and so there could be resistance from the ground then. So, Another uh, example would be on the speed restrictions on, let's say, barangay roads up to, I believe, local roads uh, could be explored in general by cities. You know? So especially uh, in cases when there are very narrow roads, so I believe a lot of LGUs, uh, even within an LGU, you know, there are a lot of roads na uh, minsan one day ng talaga, um, and that's already shared by different transport, transport modes, including walking. So speed re restrictions could be explored uh, along those to, um, uh, to also welcome the light EVs. Uh, next, we go to the information and communication instruments. Right. So um, at the national level, um, vehicle labeling in some countries are set up to ensure that at the point of sale, like the showroom or malls, um, the buyer is able to see the efficiency of vehicles. So, nakasulat doon yung kilometers per liter. So, in, in a lot of countries, that is often linked to a subsidy program or let's say a higher tax uh, in cases uh, of, uh, for the more fuel inefficient vehicles. No? So, uh, but that is often done at the national level. Now, at the local level, le local level naman, um, uh, other other parts go to muna sa national level ano, uh, and the uh, information and communication also is uh, are the awareness campaigns. So these are targeted in terms of communicating the, the national direction, which gives more confidence to the industry, the importers and the manufacturers. And these are often linked to the social, economic, and environmental objectives of the government, like uh, sustainable development goals, uh, NDCs, uh, fuel reuse reduction um, to ensure better uh, energy security. So at the city level, uh, what are these opportunities? Um, these are also important, um, especially no, the in information and communication. So this is a new technology, and thus we need to engage the stakeholders at the local level. So in e trike users, uh, those even with repair shops, how do we better take care of EVs, e-trikes, 
how do we get them on board to multiply the dissemination efforts of uh, the LGU or the authorities? No? So um, what could be explored kaya sa information and, and communication side? So, um, and, and again, we go back to the um, kumbaga yung capacity na LGU dito to see what the needs are from the ground up. No? So they can support the demand generation as we mentioned earlier, like of the industries, the LGU offices that are operating vehicle fleets. So yun. Um, so the, all of these no, um, can be used to achieve behavioral change and technological change. So now we go to the technology instruments. So this can be supported by um, uh, at the national level, um, let's say clean production and technology. So often the technology is under the national government, um, but these can be supported at the local level uh, or regional level no? uh, with more pilot projects and demonstrations. So underground proof of concepts. No? So we put here the pilot projects at the local level. It's the same as what we're doing with Pasig City uh, among other cities. Okay, so organizational level. Um, so at both the national and the local level, procurement can be an area to support the transition. So in addition to electrifying their own fleets, government agencies, uh, including the local authorities, can push their general suppliers or contractors, uh, for example, who are active in the city, to use EVs. Okay. So other uh, organizational tools include leveraging city-owned properties like the parking uh, spots uh, and street sites that are or the roads that are um, under the purview of the government uh, city government so public garage on street space can be used for charging infrastructure then so yeah all right um let's see all right so um a few i think two more slides um so one Area to note is that the planning aspect. So we're grateful to be working with Pasig on enhancing the uh, plans to integrate e-mobility through a roadmap, as Sarah has mentioned. So basically, an SUMP, Sustainable Urban Mobility Planning, uh, is an integrated strategic long-term transport planning with clear goals and monitoring um, that aims at better accessibility and quality of life for the functional urban area. Um, so this is, uh, I think, I believe my last slide. So e-mobility should not be a standalone measure. So it has to be integrated into the uh, the whole local level or urban mobility planning process. So this is an image of the SUMP process, and it provides a basic set of questions to guide the planning process. So uh, here you have like, what are our resources? So let's set up our uh, working structure. Like if PASI already has its uh, steering committee to plan and implement e-mobility solutions uh, on the ground. Um, you know, you see, so the city is able to reflect on um, what is our planning context, what is our baseline, um, which is what we, which is the state where we are in now, uh, what are our options, and we'll hear shortly from the different sectors later, um, uh, what kind of city do we want? So this is more on the visioning and the planning now. So uh, we will share the slides uh, at least for uh, participants though, uh, who have registered so you can access this. But um, just a key takeaway, um, these are the important matters to be uh, reminded of, especially at the local level. Vision and planning, it's always important to go back to the question of how do you see your economy moving in 10, 20 years? How are they powered? So if something is moving um, and it's not human powered, you have to think about the energy source. So with this, you have to revisit and coordinate with uh, uh, those who are planning uh, or developing the long-term energy goals. Uh, second, the cost. Again, we will hear, uh, we have been hearing about the, the challenges in purchase costs. So challenges remain with regard to financing programs. A lot of sectors uh, need support. So we often hear about high upfront costs, uh, unknown costs for the maintenance, um, because even if we talked about, oh, this is uh, uh, operational wise, this is actually uh, more, less expensive, but it's an, an unknown um, area. Pa. So capacity, 
lack of trained maintenance personnel, also even from the regulator or policymakers side, a lot of solutions are available. Um, there are uh, there could be uncertain uncertainties parin as to what capacity should be built, whose expertise to enhance, sino ba ang dapat i-capacitate. Um, so that goes uh, back again to the multi-stakeholder planning and engagement and identifying the actors and their roles. So, so again, with the immobility, you're looking at import, importation, manufacturing, technologies, financial programs, regulations, and the different policy instruments. No? So um, if it's, a, relic, if it's a, a new concept, uh, support is greatly needed uh, to ensure that the right actors are involved. So... Um, that's all, and I believe uh, throughout this session we'll hear from perspectives of, of um, shared mobility. I see from the agenda the enterprises or SMEs uh, and, and e-trikes or e-three wheelers, which are all within the, the purview of LG. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kat. So she showed us how there are different actors and stakeholders involved when we talk about e-mobility from the local and national governments, the CSOs, the private sector, as well as the consumers. It is important that the EV program is anchored on addressing core challenges in the Philippines. And we also saw the different policy instruments that national and local governments can adopt to implement e-mobility initiatives in the country's transport sector. So th these are policies that can influence the supply side, manufacturing, setting the emission standards, and deregulation of vehicles. So e-mobility should be integrated in the sustainable urban mobility planning process. And at the local level, vision and planning are important, as well as the engagement with the different stakeholders. So we are moving on to a three-part discussion about EVs, where the first part is about public transport, particularly three-wheelers or e-trikes. So to introduce our next speaker, here is Dr. Jose Bienvenido Viona, also known as Doc Manny, and he is an expert in the areas of sustainable mobility, environmental modeling, energy modeling, electric vehicles, and smart mobility. He is currently the executive director of EVAP and of mechanical engineering and the executive dean of the Enrique Razon Jr. Logistics Institute of the De La Salle University. He is also a technology advisor of the Tojo Motors Corporation, a local electric vehicle manufacturing company in the Philippines. For the Solutions Plus project, he leads the development of smart electric vehicles and intelligent charging network system to be piloted in Pasig City. So welcome, Doc Manny. Hi, thanks, uh, Sarah. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. So uh, I don't know if you've been attending the sessions the past day, so it's me again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll be talking about electric bicycle specification operations and the economics. So I think electric bicycles were included as part of the agenda. This is something very common to almost all LGUs in, 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 in the Philippines. So then we all be talking about, uh, of course, you know this already, bicycles, what are bicycles? So, but we'll just like, just, Let's just look at uh, what, how, how are tricycles used in the different areas of the country. And then the changing space of tricycles, the e trike technology, e trike economics, operations, design and viability. Then there's always a question to retrofit or not, because we see now a lot of um, tricycles that are being retrofitted, or even some other, that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, pedicabs that are fitted with uh, with the uh, electric uh, drive trains, okay, mostly uh, hub motors. And then let's try to look at some key points. Yeah. So I think you're, you're, you're all familiar with the bicycles are used for public or family transport. And right now there is factor 650,000 public transport units all over Metro Manila and the daily kilometers travel is 40 to 100. Mostly used for last mile, but uh, I think you all know that the provinces is the main mode of made of uh, intra-city uh, transport and intra-municipality transport. So you only have, you only have motorcycle, you only have jeepneys okay, for, uh, connecting cities and connecting municipalities, but within each, it's uh, the tricycles are, are the main, uh, are the main uh, prime, uh, prime movers. While in uh, urban areas like Metro Manila, uh, it's mostly in a, it's mostly in a, in local roads, so it's supposed to be main local roads, main roads. That's supposed to be um, urban urban areas. 
But with that alone, that indicates that uh, if there's a different, if there's difference in application, and that means also that uh, most probably we we need different bicycle electric bicycles for 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 each. And also uh, going further, if you go around the, the Philippines, then um, you will see a lot of uh, electric, uh, a lot of tricycle design. So it varies a lot. So meron sa mga, let's say, sa butuan, okay, or pagadian, yung tricycles is uh, parang lagi nagdadasal, nakaharap sa langit. Okay? So you would see it there, the lower, lower left. Ano? Um, while for some areas like uh, Puerto Princesa, uh, Puerto Princesa, it serves also some uh, some sort of a sort of a of, of a jeepney, so bigger capacity yung mga yung mga uh, tricycles. But in Metro Manila, Manila, we see a lot of the normal tricycles, around three to four uh, passenger capacity tricycles, so smaller one because uh, in Metro Manila or urban areas are normally used for um, for last mile last mile services, and um, Okay, we will see also on, on the right how tricycles are, are, are loaded. So normally they're loaded beyond their, their, their capacity. So why am I mentioning this? Thing? So these are things that needs to be considered when we, we now look at the, the right electric uh, tricycle solution. So we have to be very uh, conscious about uh, what, how, how the tricycle will be used, how will it be loaded, where it will be running, because all these things will define the design of the tricycles. And uh, so no single electric tricycle will fit all. So you have to be conscious about, uh, about uh, um, okay, those things. And right now, there's a changing phase of uh, Philippine tricycles. So before, we know that a tricycle to be a motorcycle fitted with the sidecar. But now it's getting different. Uh, if you go around, let's say you go, you go to, um, to Tagaytay, you now see the one on the upper left. So you mga bad judge. You're, you're, you're now having these tricycles that are symmetrically designed. So you have the driver in front and you have you have a wheel in front and you have two wheels at, 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 at the back. So it's getting uh, very uh, very common now. So I think it's just that uh, the, 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 uh, the public and the tricycle sector are um, realizes now that that is a better design. That is a more convenient design, both for the drivers and also for the uh, also for the commuting uh, for the commuting public. Okay, uh, let's try to look at the technology of electric uh, tricycles. I, I want to take first um, a, a tricycle that is uh, driven in in main roads. And uh, normally what we have right now are the e POE e tricycles. You see that on the right. So in, in, in those cases, in these cases, uh, the speed could go up to 45 kilometers. So you will see in there, uh, 35 kilometers per hour, you will see there in the upper left corner, you will see there the, um, the drive cycle. See drive cycle is a speed time trace uh, of, 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 um, of, of the vehicle. So, uh, so it could go beyond 35 kilometers. In fact, in some cases, I believe in the provinces, it could even go beyond 40, 45, 50, 50 kilometers. And uh, depending on the load, that, that gets translated into the speed power distribution curve, uh, graph, which now indicates there that uh, somehow you would need a tricycle, um, electric tricycle motor, uh, a tricycle powered by a 4 kilowatt motor. So, you will see on the on the graph on, on the right of the drive cycle, you will see in there how the power distribution requirement of a tricycle looks like. And um, yeah, most of those dots are, are below four kilowatts. So um, four kilowatts is your rated power, but it doesn't mean that you're only confined to that uh, power range. You can actually go beyond four kilowatts at, uh, at very short, uh, uh, snippets, very short time. So, so, uh, so at the average, tricycles used in main roads should at least be four kilowatts, and I think it should be enough also, or even for those used in in in, in the in the provinces. Uh, if you want to have a range of forty or fifty kilometers, it, then you should have a battery of around four point two. Uh, Kilowatts and the passenger capacity, these are six plus one. So this is designed for bigger services. And this currently costs around 300, 
fifty uh, fifty thousand. So what I'm why am I showing this? So if someone offers you a tricycles and it's to be used in a okay, in main roads and the having capacity spatial capacity is around six to around six uh, passengers, then you have to check what's the what's the traction motor rating and what is the battery what is the battery uh, rating. If it's below than that, then it must be it it could be underpowered. Of course, it depends on how you're going to use it and what's the speed really in the areas that you're going to use it um, in. Um, let's now try to look at, let's now try to have a quick look of uh, electric, uh, electric uh, three, three wheeler economics. So, this is a comparison. So, I'm not comparing, by the way, I'm not comparing anymore an electric tricycle with the, with the normal tricycle that we have. Because in here, we're, we're looking at a bigger tricycle. Like bigger electric bicycles, so I'm comparing it with the Bajaj Maxima Z, which is very common right now. Um, uh, investment cost at electric bicycle, similar to that of, um, of DOE. Of course, the one of DOE is a bit uh, more expensive because that is heated with a very expensive, very expensive battery. Uh, but if you're going to use a, a, a normal lithium phosphate battery, then you're looking at an investment around 350,000 pesos. Uh, compare that with a Bajaj Maxima, which costs you 121,000 pesos. So you have a very big cost difference there, upfront cost difference of 129,000 pesos. So that would be a very big issue for, for the tricycle uh, sector. Okay, also, um, it has always been asked, uh, how, how do we replace it? How much would be the batteries? So. Okay, over time, you have to replace your batteries depending on the type of batteries you're using. So it could be every three years, it could be four years. It also, dep also depends on the size of your battery and uh, what is the daily uh, mile age. So, of course, um, that is also an added cost. So if you get the difference, okay, that is an added expense. However, utilizing uh, electric tricycles like the, the, um, the electric versus the Bajaj Maxima Z, could provide you significant energy, energy uh, savings. So in fact, uh, it easily supersedes the uh, investment cost. So, and um, electric bicycles, like also electric jeepneys, requires very little maintenance. So it provides you also a lot of uh, with a lot of regular maintenance savings, a lot of midlife rebuilding. So, how about midlife rebuilding? So. Uh, normally, if you have a car, you would at some point you would have to you would have to rebuild the engine. You would have to uh, you would have to overhaul the engine. You would have to paint your vehicle. So so th this uh, this is what we mean by midlife rebuilding. So they also extract some some savings, and then of course you have a since you have a more expensive vehicle, and at the end of the day, if you want to, to sell it at the end of the operational life, you want to sell it. And assuming that um, um, the salvage value is a function of your investment cost, then you get also some, some savings in there in the long term. Okay, by the way, these are net present values. The discounted uh, the discount um, interest is was set at 10%. And um, the use of electric bicycles provides you health benefits, provides you greenhouse gas, uh, social cost reductions or savings. Um, it improves the economy by reducing the amount of uh, fuel imports that will be uh, that we need to to do uh, to 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 power the uh, the, the tricycles. Um, so the balance of payments is difference between the uh, importation and the, uh, and the and the and the and the export. So it provides you also with a lot of a uh, a lot a lot of savings along that line. And then of course, lastly, but on taxes since. Petroleum uh, is taxed more, then government is set to lose some, some tax revenue. But at the end of the day, uh, you get financial savings. Uh, and then you get also economic, uh, the country also gets some economic, uh, significant economic savings, emanating from the health, greenhouse gas, and balance of uh, balance of um, payments. So if you look at if you're gonna look at this economics. The main issue really in the tricycle adoption is the higher initial cost. Then second, operational limitations. So we know that uh, these uh, tricycles are fitted with batteries that in some cases have limited range. So just imagine if your average 
uh, daily kilometers is 70 and then the range of your battery is only 30. It means that at some point during the day, you would have to, you would have to, um, to charge the battery. And in some cases, it, uh, depending on the battery and depending on the charging that you use, it takes a lot of time. So that's one. And then second, um, which means also this, uh, your, 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 um, this confines also the operation of the vehicle just around the battery swapping stations or just around just within the vicinity where, where charging points are, are available. So uh, you have some operational limitations in there. And then also since we're dealing with the higher initial cost and um, considering also that the budget maxima, they are widely available and are internally, mostly are internally financed by the suppliers themselves, then uh, we can say that electric classicals have very limited financing options. Okay, while uh, a number of electric classical suppliers are also financing the, uh, financing the sales of these units themselves, uh, these are mostly SMEs. So um, they have some fund limitations, so they can only loan to, uh, to a uh, limited amount of uh, a limited amount of units. So there's a need to expand the financing options okay, for electric classicals. And there's a minimum daily VKT thresholds. So what what do we mean by that? If you look at the economics, um, the savings mostly comes from the energy used. Okay, but um, the energy consumption or cost depends on the amount of energy consumed, and that depends on the uh, daily vehicle kilometer threshold. We are going to talk more about that. But the main idea behind it is, uh, if you're only using the uh, if the daily mileage of tricycle says only 20 kilometers, then you might not have some uh, some payback period in there. So there are there's a certain minimum daily threshold depending on the tricycle design. And then uh, varying operational regimes, which I'm going to discuss more later. <clears throat> yeah. So what are the um, what, um so what are the the options now? So okay, one is as we're talking about operational limitation. Uh, one is to to um to list the batteries. So instead of buying them, and then using a bigger battery, so that you address also your you address also your uh, the, the range uh, limitations. So if you remove the battery cost okay, from the vehicle, so you only buy the vehicle without the battery, um, your, the cost difference drastically goes down. So if you recall previously, it's 129,000, it goes down to around 59,000. But of course, that increases your battery rental expense. Because before, what happens here is you buy one set of battery, if you're, if you're talking about swapping, you buy one set of battery and then you lease the second battery or you rent the second battery. Okay, but this time, the idea is you buy only the unit without the battery and then you lease a big battery which you can use, so which you don't have to charge at midday. <clears throat> so that also that increases on the other hand, your battery, uh, um, uh, replace, uh, battery rental cost. This time it's going to be purely battery rental cost because you're not owning the battery. So at least I think one thing good also with this setup is you don't have to think anymore about, uh, oh, I'm going to replace the battery. I have to save for it because you're only renting the, because you're only renting the, uh, uh, the battery. That somehow reduces your, your financial savings. Okay, but it makes things, it makes things more, more afford affordable um, upfront. Um, there's also an option to use fast charging batteries. So you don't have to increase the size of your batteries. You just have to charge them fast. So um, you don't have to bring down the, uh, you, 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 um, you, need, you don't need to really increase the capacity of the battery. Because anyway, you can charge them at midday um, at a very fast rate. So maybe 15 to 20 minutes, and then you're fine. You're fine again. Um, okay, in this case, Okay, it increases your battery, um, your battery uh, rental, um, your battery um, okay, rental cost, because the, the, these batteries are are uh, are more expensive. But um, but uh, this type of batteries are okay, are very durable. So in the long run, you actually also save. Now, um, however, in both cases, if you're gonna do leasing then 
your your battery system needs to have certain um finan uh, certain cer certain technological features like GPS tracking, remote condition monitoring and maintenance control, tamper tracing, improving, and then uh, charging encryption. Alam naman natin na yung Pilipino is a mabuting thing. So kung nilagay mo yung battery, if I'm the supplier, I put in my battery, there I have at least. So chances are pwedeng buting tingin yun nung gumagawa kasi uh, curious doon. So dapat tamper, uh, tamper proof siya and dapat trace mo kung talagang Buting thing ngayon, no? Then I'll track mo because that's a very expensive equipment. And then you, you should know also kung pasira na yung isang battery or hindi para, para maagapan mo agad. And it's important also for the one that's doing the battery releasing to to um, to uh, look at yung charging um, encryption. Ibig sabihin, hindi niya pwedeng isaksak sa kahit anong, anong charger because that's, that's the main cause of, a, of battery uh, deterioration kung hindi mo magamit ka ng ibang ng ibang chargers. Okay, by the way, before I continue, uh, saan nagagaling mostly yung additional savings dito sa second part? If you look at energy costs, it's a lot it's a lot bigger. Because uh, if you've attended my talk the previous day, uh, two days ago, um, mas mahal ang mag-battery swap ka. Okay, or uh, com compared with ano, compared with um, compared with fast, uh, fast charging. Okay. Now, we're talking about uh, daily vehicle kilometers traveled. Okay. So these are just some of the thresholds. So this is the base unit. Maliit na battery, pero nagsaswap ka, and then you have your high-range batteries, then you have your fast charging batteries. Uh, simulan ko sa fast charging batteries saka high-rate high batteries, high-range high batteries. So dito makikita natin that the financial saving increases with the uh, okay, with the um daily vehicles vehicle kilometers. So in fact, so makikita natin dito, it crosses the the zero line at around what? At around uh, 35, around 32 kilometers. So kung yung daily range ng takbo mo is below 32 or below 35, then magandang mag-ordinary mo a tricycle ka na lang. Because you won't have any uh, savings from there. So there is that, that threshold. It should be at least that amount of, uh, of uh, kilometers. Now, if you do, if you do um, then the base, the base unit, which is a smaller battery, and then you swap somewhere. So um, in here, it increases your savings. And then at some point, you need to, because in here, you own the battery. But para pagdating mo dito, kailangan mo na ng extra battery kasi lagpas na sa range ng battery mo. So kailangan mo na mag-rent. So it suddenly goes down and then it goes up. Again, so may mga threshold ka na na tinitignan. Okay. Um, these values, this graph would vary depending on the design, on the price of the vehicles. But I just want to point out in here na na uh, importanting tignan yung daily vehicles vehicle kilometers. So by the way, this is only for just for one for one model. Okay. Now, uh, bakit may mga pictures dito on the side? <clears throat> In Metro Manila, karamihan ng electric tricycle adoption dito are either subsidized, just like the one of uh, Manila City, or donated just like the one of uh, BOE and then uh, distributed to the operators at a very low um, uh, monthly, monthly payments. But if you go to Coron, if you go to Naga, if you go to Boracay, um, walang subsidy yun, but it works. So bakit sila gumagana doon? Kasi in the provinces, as we mentioned earlier, uh, tricycles are the main mode of transport, say for for uh, for butuan, for butuan, it's the main mode of transport. Okay, or or naga, so malalaki yung mileage nila in a day. So that's why it works. So I think that also uh, supports the the graph that we have here. That, that there's really that minimum mileage that you need to look at. I don't want to discuss any more those red, red uh, text in there because really more on the technical side. I think I want to stick with the more on the concepts. Now, <clears throat> um, 
healthcare operational regime. This is one of the issues kung saan, kung bakit may mga attempts to adopt tricycles that at some point uh, natigil. Okay. Um, most of the tricycles looks like uh, the one in the picture. Electric tricycles. Malaki yung capacity. Kasi yung idea is uh, it serves, it, it can bring in, it, it can carry more passengers, it can have greater revenue. But then eventually you have better better um, payback period. Better, yeah. Mas faster, mas, mas economical siya. Mas financially rewarding. Okay. Um, but right now we know that we're having the PUV modernization. The transport modernization, modernization program. And DOTR advocates that, uh, pushes that um, key tricycles that uh, routes that were previously served by tricycles, but the demand has already increased, okay, will now be served with, by class one GPs, which is which is the right move. I said bigger, bigger capacity. So enough na yung kaya na yung, kaya na ng demand yung class one GP. So it's better to adopt class one GPs in there. So the question now is that in most of those routes, yun yung ruta na si reserve nitong bigger electric tricycles na to. So the question now is where do you move them? Where do you put them? So if you're going to compare their economics with class one cheapies, hindi ba nanalo yung economics sila? Okay. Um, they will always uh, be more, more expensive compared to class one GPs. So, in comparing them with bicycles, with the normal bicycles, the smaller ones, hindi rin mananado <coughs> economics nila. Kasi di, normally, ang operations sa mga to is mga nasa internal roads lang. So, if they operate in internal roads, and normally, they operate, they deserve uh, uh, um, last mile services, point to point, wherein people don't wait anymore for other passengers, they, they, they would have them as special trips um, then their added revenue provided by their bigger capacity um, won't, won't, won't matter. So, so you now have a problem. Where do you put out these bigger tricycles? It can't compete against last one GPs. It can't compete with small tricycles in smaller in in, in internal roads. Okay, where where the operations will be okay, will be uh, different. So in that case, then you might need to look at smaller we might need to bring down the sizes of electric uh electric tricycles so we might have to consider those and in that case we're looking at this configuration around two kilowatts battery size of around 2.5 kilowatt lithium phosphate uh, batteries uh range of around 50 kilometers passenger three plus one as that breaks down your cost of 250 000. and if you could compare that to a bajaj re bajaj re if they measure mas maliit ng konti, Okay, then you will see now that you have a positive, positive um, economics. So I, I think this only emphasizes that no, no single solution fits all. It, you really have to consider anong daily mileage siya, saan siya tumatako, how the vehicles operate. Um, yeah, and and look for the right, uh, look for the right uh, solution. Okay. Now there's also a talk about uh, why not just retrofit. Okay, so number one. Lack of a uh, lack of standards. So uh, right now, uh, in the Bureau of Product Standards, in our technical committee, we're still defining, we still have to craft a standards for for electric vehicle retrofitting. Um, it's a bit difficult because normally the process is you look for international standards and then just you just review it, and then check whether it's applicable for you. If not, then modify it a bit. Uh, but uh, there is no international standards currently available for, for uh, electric vehicle retrofitting. Um, and also, if you want to modernize, we're not just talking about the power crane. We know also, already, also we know already how, how, how uh, inconvenient and how uncomfortable it is to ride the, uh, the some, some, not all, some of the uh, tricycles, lalo yung mga mababa, ano? So, so, um, so at some point we would have to uh, we would have to migrate to a more convenient uh, design. 
And then most units are so old anyway, so why still retrofit them? Why not just shift them to a new one? And um, but uh, right now, just a government-funded project that is ongoing to okay, look at to look at this possibility and to, then to develop a kit, which could also be a basis for for the crafting of a an internal or locally uh, uh, developed uh, standards for for classical retrofitting and cheap new retrofitting. Okay, just some key points. Um, you have to look at uh, what's the performance that you need. And uh, you have to look at also the initial cost that may be sheltered by the economics. And uh, you have to look at the long-term economics uh, for, for, um, for an electric classical program to work. We can also say that uh, for an electric classical program to work, then you have to satisfy performance uh, requirements. You have to satisfy the initial cost. Uh, it shouldn't have a, a very big price disparity upfront. And, um, and the long-term economics would have to be would have to be positive. Uh, you need to look for the right solution because, as I always emphasize, different areas, different applications, different mileage uh, requires different uh, different solutions. Uh, electrification might always be the solution, but if it is, if it is, then adopt it. Um, if the daily BKT is too short, then you'll have a you'll have a, um, a problem. If uh, energy costs or power costs in the air is too expensive, then you can have a, you can have a problem. Does it mean that if it works in one area, it will also work in your, in your area? If it is uh, very heady, then check the economics. Because if it is very heady, chances are you need bigger motors, more expensive units. So, um, so yeah, so you have to weigh all this. Uh, you have to weigh all these things. It's good always to have a really a scientific study in the area before, and then a, a an unbiased look at uh, what's applicability of electric bicycles in your in your uh, localities. And the best solution may not always be the most advanced one, as you would see here in the picture. This now get common in 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 uh, in Europe and in other parts of the world. You have there a pedalec. So I don't know if familiar with a pedalec. No? So pedalec is basically an electric electric as uh, it's a pedal assisted electric uh, electric um, um, vehicle. So while you pedal as a sensor system and to ng ng electric motor yung yung tao. So gu so gumagaan. So so again going back to the car scenario we're in higher capacity bicycle routes are now being converted into class one units and that leaves now the uh, internal roads to be served by bicycles. The speed in internal roads are not that fast. So why not adopt something like this? You, you, you can do a pedalec, that solves your problem on charging, that solves your problem on battery cost, uh, and that solves your problem on, on cost. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Doc Manny. So we saw the situation revolving around tricycles in the Philippines, which interestingly vary per city or province in the country, depending on how the locals use public transport. Some use it for last mile services, while others also use it in transporting cargo. So he also talked about the evolution of tricycles in the Philippines, where we see now a growing number of e-trikes replacing the conventional tricycles. One e-trike starts at around 250,000 pesos, so there may still be barriers to owning an e-trike. But as he said, the energy savings accrued can eventually supersede the investment cost. And also highlighted were key points to consider with e-trikes aside from the cost, including the performance and long-term economics. Right now, we'd also like to know the experience on the ground demand of those working on e-trikes in Pasig. So if I may call Vance Dumawal, so Vance is also a part of passing transport, handling all things related to the e-trikes under the care of the city. Hi, Vance. Are you there? Hi, Mom. Good Hi, afternoon. So, good afternoon. So can you share your experiences so far sa pag-handle ng e-trikes sa Pasig? Kino-sino ba yung mga gumagamit ng e-trikes? Saka kamusta naman yung operations and maintenance? 
Saka ano-ano rin yung challenges na na-experience niya so far? Actually, we have two different kinds of e-trikes. Allery and DMAC, total of 400 units. So, ang mga recipients po natin or um, e-trike holder is health center, senior citizen, barangay hall, and toga. Then, sa Allery po yon. Sa BMAC, e-trike naman po is um, public schools, homeowners, local government units, and to- toga. So, ang challenge po namin sa, pag, uh, sa mga e-trike ngayon, is charging station dahil po um ang charging station po kasi natin ngayon sa mga uh, sa mga homeowners is sa mga bahay-bahay lang po sila nagcha-charge. So if ever po na bumiyahe po sila along the way po at medyo malayo po yung uh, pinuntahan nila. Ang struggle po namin doon is pag nalobat po yung unit nila. Ang ano po namin is yung charging station saan po sila magcha-charge. Yun po yung isa sa mga struggle ng mga homeowners at ng mga toda. Lalong-lalo na po sa mga toda kasi po bumabiyahe po sila. So isa po sa mga struggle nila is yung mag-charge ng ilang oras dahil po um dahil nga po bumabiyahe sila at kailangan po nilang kumuha ng uh, pambayad dun sa unit nila at uh, kumita ng sapat na pera para sa kanilang pamilya, may uwi sa kanilang pamilya. So, hindi po sila makabiyahe ng todo dahil po ilang oras po yung pag-charge ng mga e-trike. So, yun po yung isa sa mga struggle namin sa uh, toda po. Then, sa ano naman po, sa sa mga schools naman po minsan, ang struggle din naman po namin is kapag po yung area is um, bahain naman. Meron po kasi kaming four flooded units. So, yun po isa sa mga struggle po namin ngayon. Um, hindi po namin, hindi pa namin alam kung paano po um, aayusin yung battery nila. Dahil po kasi sa sobrang mahal po ng battery, hindi pa po kaya ng uh, schools yung pagbili ng bago ng, pagbili ng bago ng, ng battery. So, isa po yun sa mga struggle namin. Yeah. Okay. Um, in response to that, um, so, so I, I, I'm going to answer it uh, ng magkahiwalay. Okay. Let's first try to look at the DOE uh, e-trikes. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in case of the DOE e-trikes, medyo limited ng pwede natin gawin kas, uh, as long as they're still under warranty. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know kung ilang, ilang years pa ba bago mag-expire yung warranty nila. Are, are you familiar? Five years, sir. And pang ilang year na ngayon? Since 2016 po kasi yung nakalagay ah. sa warranty. Okay, so so medyo malapit na. So, so, so by next year, independent na siyang galawin. Okay. Yes. So, um, why, why, why am I saying this? Because uh, the, uh, the OEE trash are fitted with Toshiba batteries. These are lithium titanate oxide batteries. These are really good batteries that could be fast charged. In fact, theoretically, it could be charged in like 15 minutes time or even less, and you're good to go. Um, but the electronic that goes with it limits the amount of, ba- of power that flows in- into, the, into the battery, uh, which could be an issue. Of course, I would also understand the part, the, the part of the supplier because he wants also to protect his, his investment. Kasi siya, siya under warranty yan, siya sasagot kung sakaling masira ka agad yan. Yeah, but those are very good uh, batteries. So maybe what we can do there, we can explore the possibility once the warranty has ended, explore the possibility of uh, retrofitting the electronics of the of those um, of the e-bikes. Now, uh, DOST is currently funding a, a project. They're currently funding uh, UP to come up with uh, with the uh, um, e-trike electronics. Which you can, which I think would be, uh, would be, uh, could be easily adopted in these, in these uh, e-trike, uh, DOE e-trikes. Alternatively, from our, from our end also, um, we're developing the electronics for the, is also the USC funded, uh, and also of course, uh, UN Habitat funded under this project. We're also developing the, the electronics and the battery, battery electronics for, for the e-quads. It's something also that we can. Uh, We can look at so maybe under the frame of this project, uh, we can we can do that. Uh, we we can we can do that. 
and we hope to be able to charge them in 20, 30 minutes time or even less. Of course, we have to test things. So it also depends on the condition of the uh, battery. Now, for the second one, uh, the Allery units, uh, definitely we have, to re we have to replace the batteries, but they, they cost a lot. And uh, uh, some of the electric, electric bike companies list out batteries. So maybe that is something that we can look at. I, I know for one, Tojo Motors, they're leasing out batteries. But um, of course, we have to look at also the condition of the vehicles. The vehicles might be too old already. Na baka it's better that you buy a, a new one na lang. So uh, and of course, it depends also if uh, the batteries that they're offering are fits the uh, fits the system of the Allery, um, Allery uh, tricycles. But that is something that could be uh, that is something that could be explored. And also under the Solutions Plus project, uh, we're planning out the charging network uh, in, in Pasig City. Um, but in the case of those two vehicles, they will be charging using the, the, the metered AC outlets that we're, that we're going to roll out. So, but, but in that case, although they can charge, but uh, the charging rates would, would, still be, would still be slow. But uh, we can do anything about it because it's the electronics of the existing system that... Uh, Okay, that defines the charging rate. Yeah, but those are, I think, the options for, for those uh, for the Allery and the, the OEE trikes. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much, Doc Manny, for answering. And also to Van for sharing your experiences on the ground. Thank you, Ma'am Sarah. So moving on to the next presentation, it will be about shared mobility devices which will be presented by Alvin Mejia. Alvin is a research fellow at the Wuppertal Institute. He has more than 10 years of professional experience specializing on energy, transport, and climate change, and working on projects related to sustainable transport. He holds a master's degree in transportation management from the University of Sydney, a master of arts in environmental management from Miriam College, and a bachelor's degree in, in economics. Welcome, Alvin. Sige. Uh, salamat, Sara. Uh, magandang, magandang tanghali, magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. Uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm uh, Alvin Mejia from the Wuppertal Institute, and today I'll be talking about shared mobility services. So shared e-mobility under the context of, uh, let's say, the wider concept of uh, new mobility services. Uh, for our international uh, participants, uh, I would like to apologize uh, in advance if I would be switching between uh, English Hello. and Filipino. Hello? Okay, someone speaking, sorry. Um, so yeah, just to, to uh, facilitate, siguro para din uh, mas uh, engaging yung aking uh, pag-talk uh, with regards to new mobility services. Um, so again, we are uh, doing this uh, as part of the... Uh, Solutions Plus project. Sorry, can someone mute the? Hello. Sorry. Um, maybe if I can ask our uh, friends from Cleaner Asia to to mute the participant. Sorry, I'm hearing a lot of noise. Then. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we're doing this as part of the Solutions Plus project, which is a global project consisting of more than 40 uh, or 45 consortium members. Um, we're working with the 10 uh, cities globally in terms of accelerating uh, e-mobility concepts. So not just uh, in terms of e-vehicles, but also in terms of operations, uh, as well as the uh, supportive uh, business models, as well as uh, policies. You know? um, and Pasig City is one of our key partners in the project. So what I'm going to talk to you about today it would be uh, focusing on new mobility services, um, again, um, with a certain emphasis on uh, shared e-mobility. Uh, I'll just talk through the relevant uh, operations and charging concepts, as well as go through some of the potential impacts uh, in terms of the urban environment, um, uh, social impacts, as, uh, some uh, economic impacts as well. And then I'll go through some of the uh, examples of uh, different policy responses that have been or are, are being uh, implemented globally. Um, and I leave you with one slide later on um, localizing some of these uh, insights uh, 
uh, not just in the case of Pasig, but uh, just yeah, in, in uh, Philippine urban setting in general. So uh, just this uh, concept now, it's uh, the, the emerging concept um, that I would be talking about, it's called new mobility services. This is like a common term that's uh, now being adopted. Um, kasama na din po dito, later I have a typology, pero kasama na din dito yung mga shared e-mobility uh, e services natin. Um, but the way it's uh, transforming now in terms of this disruptive uh, concept is that it combines um, sustainable mobility resources, it combines um, digital data platforms, and combines the uh, emergent business models that go with the combination of these elements. And the thing is that it, um, while the, the concept is focusing on providing mobility services, we're seeing a lot of integration with other non-mobility sectors later. I'll, I'll have a slide on that. But essentially, for example, it could be in terms of um, sharing mobility resources. So hindi lang po yung sasakyan yung pwedeng i-share, no? Um, pwedeng yung yung vehicle trip. So kung meron kang sasakyan, pupunta ka from uh, Ortigas to Makati, um, you can share the vehicle trip, the person trip, the vehicle itself. So kung hindi mo ginagamit yung sasakyan, iwanan mo, then you, you, know, you share it through the platform. Um, there are also emergent concepts in terms of um, sharing human resources. Uh, a lot of these things are happening in terms of urban logistics na um, merong common um, platform for sharing yung mga yung mga last mile um, delivery personnel, for example, yung mga nagbabike din, ano? Um, and then parking spaces. So not just the vehicle services, but also infrastructure. And a lot of uh, emerging business models are uh, coming out of this. So we can look into subscription-based, uh, trip-based revenue models, crowdsourced operations, um, and enabling digital advertising. This is very uh, transformational, service bundling. And it also enables um, yung different uh, nodes natin ano, kung, kung, kung um, business to business or business to customer or peer to peer. Um, in, in terms of the platform, it enables crowdsourced data, enables the payment, enables access to different uh, users, to different resources, and um, gives a lot of flexibility in terms of planning, in terms of scheduling, in terms of booking, in terms of payment and also uh, enables the operators to monitor the system um, in, a, in a better way. Uh, just a, a very basic example, uh, e-moped sharing, or e, sa ating e uh, scooter naman tawag natin dito, pero um, e-moped sharing, this is something, uh, for example, this, the project, Solutions Plus project is uh, exploring also in Hanoi. Um, so meron tayong uh, mobility technology would consist of uh, kunyari, electric uh, scooters that, that would be equipped with uh, um, Internet of Things sensors. So makakapag-usap siya between the vehicles, between the infrastructure, uh, the charging infrastructure, for example, and the users then. No? So alam natin real time na saan yung mga sasakyan, ano yung charge niya, um, ano yung uh, mamamonitor kung ano yung ginawang vehicle kilometers um, and yung, yung trips nung, nung vehicle, for example. <laughs> And in terms of business model, unique value proposition because of the flexibility. Um, again, different revenue models because you can do a lot of the, like uh, uh, digitally based uh, revenue models and it caters to very specific customer segments. And the platform itself, um, you know, you have the, the app user interface, you have the back end that enables the unique service features and business models. Uh, ito po kunyari sa Indonesia yung Gojek. Um, Yung, yung buong system hindi lang sa pag uh, provide ng services so they're integrating them into you know uh, things like uh, food payments etc uh, so it yun na yung interaction between um, the mobility and non mobility sectors uh, because it also um, adds value to the uh, the business model itself this is not an exhaustive list po ng uh, different types pero i just wanted to provide an idea Yung sinabi natin kanina, um, different concepts na pwedeng vehicles, pwedeng yung rides, or meron din yung ride sourcing, ito yung parang mga ano natin, um, taxi-like services, mga Ubers, and the likes yung mga Grabs. No? Uh, merong mobility as a service uh, concept which tries to transform um, the thinking na hindi lang, kunyari, sasakay ka ng isang mode, ilipat ka ng mode, 
yung mobility as a service in, would want to integrate the different modes all together. So in, for example, in one platform, in one app. So parang uh, yung sa Google natin, uh, I would like to go from A to B, pero integrated doon na uh, ito yung sasakyan mo, ito yung payment mo, and potentially one payment in one go for, for everything. So you don't have to think about the modes, it's just about the seam, seamless transfer from point A to point B. And yeah, may mga shared parking tayo. Tapos um, meron din yung mga B2C or um, P2P na different types of models. And you would see here the different types of vehicles. And uh, um, yeah, kung, kung yung operations based. Meron akong counting slides mamaya on station based and uh, free floating. So bakit kailangan natin pag-usapan to in terms of uh, urban mobility? Uh, kasi marami pwedeng mangyari in terms of uh, how people move um, when we introduce these kinds of uh, new mobility services, uh, particularly yung mga shared services natin. Kunyari, ride, uh, uh, scenario one, ride, ride sharing. So kung meron kang sasakyan, um, sorry, explain ko lang. Base scenario, meron tatlong tao going from point A to point B. Siguro, kunyari, isipin natin from Antipolo to Ortigas. So, itong dalawang tao na to, itong dalawang dots na to, na uh, they would be walking and then transfer to a tricycle station. Tapos, lipas sila, mag-UV sila, lakad silang konti. Tapos, papunta sila ng uh, um, LRT and then going towards to the office. And the third one is just uh, someone who would drive directly. If we introduce uh, ride sharing, so the, this person here, okay, may app tayo, so the other two persons can say, okay, let's uh, we'll meet you uh, sa gate ng subdivision and then we'll uh, we'll ride together through your vehicle. Um, siguro in in this sense, um, reduction agad ng ng <clears throat> ng vehicle kilometers, but we have to uh, take into consideration that may systemic impacts yan na may incentivize yung mga tao actually to, to buy their own vehicle because they can recover some of the costs through the these types of ride sharing and ride hailing schemes. No? So yung iba, nung nakita natin dati, nung, nung introduce yung TNDS uh, regulation, I think merong uh, study na ginawa yung uh, NCTS, I think, eh, uh, that uh, yeah, the, merong evidence to prove that uh, it actually spurred um, the, the, the buying of additional vehicles to be enrolled in the system. So ganun din, um, pwedeng uh, magkaroon ng impacts in terms of, uh, kunyari itong second person natin, uh, mag, uh, ano siya ng ride hailing na, na scooter going to the, to the um, MRT station, for example. So, and this one can actually just ride um, a taxi-like service through the ride hailing app. Um, in terms of e-bike sharing, uh, meron din potential impact. So if you provide um, services uh, for these two persons here, they might be enticed to use the bike sharing going to the, for example, the UV station or yung FX natin, um, and then riding the, the train afterwards. So it complements in, in some sense no, yung ating public transport system. And for the mass, uh, mas integrated lang siya uh, because, again, it's uh, about a seamless transfer uh, as facilitated by the technology from point A to point B, the final destination. There, there could be a lot of different configurations. Ang message lang po dito na yun nga, kailangan natin integrate properly uh, kasi maraming pwedeng maging effects siya. Um, in terms of the typology na potential impacts in uh, relation to mobility, um, pwedeng short term to long term yung, yung different impacts. Um, activity choice, uh, kung ano yung gagawin kasi kung merong bagong servisyo, mode choice, kung ano yung kukunin na, na mode, no? na main mode. Yung nakita natin kanina, if it would complement public transport or would it take away from public transport. Pwede rin ma-influensya yung destination choice, kung maganda yung, kunyari, yung last, uh, last mile uh, shared services dun sa lugar. Kung mag-grocer ka between point A to point B, e, baka isipin mo, okay, dun tayo sa ano kasi mas madaling mag-commute towards the, the end and the good choice. Uh, towards the long term, depende po no, kung, kung isipin natin yung transformational uh, um, scenarios, uh, pwede rin kasi na uh, if these are properly integrated later, uh, magkaroon ng uh, wider impacts in terms of things like residential location choice, work location choice. So it could be a transformational concept as we are seeing in, in um, sa, for example, dito sa Europe, marami na nangyayari na Naganyan na transformation. So, but for the succeeding slides, I would just uh, probably um, concentrate on, on the, the light electric shared e mobility, because it's um, uh, potentially maging significant sa Pilipinas. So, 
kick scooter sharing this is just a map um hindi siya exhaustive but you'll see the diffusion it yung mga uh, kick scooter electric kick scooters that are happening sorry i think there's one already i checked uh, i think there's one that's already up in dgc uh from last year i think um and then moped sharing uh I, yeah this is also a map these are not emo e-moped sharing um in in Uh, in particular, but you'd see a lot of these things as, uh, you know, spring up uh, globally, as well as bike sharing. I think I just put dots in the Philippines because I, I know that there are a couple of uh, bike sharing uh, systems that are already up uh, in, in the Philippines. Um, so yun nabanggit ko kanina, um, emerging concepts, wala pa masyado, pero there has been one um, that has been put up in uh, DGC. Uh, yung bike sharing, I think yung, yung sa Pasig, matagal naman na yung inyong bike sharing system um, that, that was put up uh, with the support, I think, with ADB, uh, Cleaner Asia during that time. Uh, but it was not electric, but nonetheless, the, the concepts would be, you know, uh, similar in that sense. Um, this is, again, in, in, in terms of emerging concepts, this is what we're trying to do um, with the help of, uh, or in coordination, or in collaboration with the Pasig uh, City uh, Transport and the uh, Tojo Motors, Cleaner Asia, and others, are trying to put up a shared electric vehicle system that would mm, focus primarily in the demo, during the demo, uh, on uh, cargo, urban uh, urban freight applications. So we have the, the flexible electric vans that are being developed together with the, uh, supported by the DOSD. Um, and then we are doing, or, or Tojo is also supporting the development of the electric e-quads. Um, that would be the smaller vehicles. And hopefully, yung other um, existing electric vehicles, for example, ng Philpos can be integrated into the system. So this would be enabled um, through the use of uh, like uh, a user interface and decision support systems for the fleet operators. Biblis ang kukaw ng konti. E-mobility and NMS, uh, new mobility services, ano ba yung interaction niya? So uh, we think that uh, um, uh, new mobility services can accelerate the diffusion of e-mobility concepts just to put, you know, the concepts of, you know, e-vehicles on the ground. Um, but the use of e-vehicles in such schemes can also transform the mobility services provision in terms, kasi iba yung advantages or iba yung characteristics na binibigay ng ating mga electric vehicles inherently kasi electric sila in terms of operational cost, in terms of operational characteristics, Um, and it, it provides this uh, unique uh, refueling uh, na lang natin ganun, uh, modalities and can be mutually reinforcing. Um, so example concepts, it could be, again, concentrate tayo dun sa maliliit na mga sasakyan. Um, uh, it could be, you know, in terms of uh, electric uh, bicycles, electric cargo bikes, uh, e-scooters, e-mopeds, or ito, nilagay ko lang yung ating e-quad. It could be in terms of passenger transportation, freight transportation, Urban freight, or it could be mixed. Um, na isip ko ilagay yung basic concepts ng operations na station based versus free floating. Yung station based po, ito yung makikita natin kanina, yung may mga, mga dedicated na, na parking areas. Um, and in, in case of e mobility services, together with the charging stations. Um, but free floating systems, you would be able to um, operate within a certain uh, region uh, with flexibility. So the station base provides you higher security for the vehicles, for example, easier to manage, less flexibility. Um, but for the, uh, on the other hand, uh, the free floating would be more adaptable to the needs of the users. So malaki yung effect niya sa uptake, uh, although lesser yung security, tsaka more complex to manage. And in between, depending po sa modality, meron din parang geofenced models, uh, na meron very, very specific sites, for example, within the urban area where you would be able to, to park uh, and operate. Uh, and these would be monitored through the sensors that are included in the vehicles. So what would this mean in terms of charging consideration? So GU fence plus charging integrated into the station. So, parang ganito po, so within that area, you would have the, the, the charging stations, for, for example, for, for e-bicycle sharing systems. Um, dito ipapark yung, yung ating mga um, electric bikes that are being shared. Meron din operator-led um, charging concepts. So it could be as part of the uh, uh, collection redistribution processes for these types of e-bikes if it's a free-floating system. Because if it's free-floating, users can leave them anywhere. Um, but somehow these need to be charged. So it's either the operators take them back 
or depende, baka may pwede rin operator-led battery swapping. So maybe for the mopeds, ganyan yung pwede mangyari. That the operators would monitor the, the state of charge and if they see that the vehicle is uh, out of battery, they can go there change the battery. Meron din pong gig economy ito, very uh, popular, I think, uh, especially sa US, yung kanilang, uh, I think, bird yung, yung bird and lime, if I'm mistaken. So, they provide um, parang um, informal uh, employment opportunities. So, yung mga, you can sign up as a, as a charger, parang ganyan. Ano? So, your task is to locate the, the vehicles, bring them back. If you have a van, bring them back to your, your own house, or, um, and then you charge it. So, you apply for, for that certain um, gig. So, uh, yan po yung pwedeng isang modality. Yung isang concept naman nagiging uh, popular then user engagement, yung users mismo, uh, that they can be incentivized. For example, if you use the e-scooter, yung kick scooter, you can take the battery out, you go to uh, the shop where they integrate the charging equipment, um, and then you get a certain discount uh, for your ride, for example. So, you integrate yung yung charging points dun sa, for example, yung mga, mga shops natin. I think this one is, I took this from here um, because they're doing this model currently. They're proper, pro proliferating it uh, globally. Um, yeah, so I'll just now go through some of the potential impacts, um, uh, different impacts. Uh, urban space, so depend po, it could actually, um, in, in theoretically, um, may, uh, Positive total positive impact if if would it would really take away uh, the mindset from ownership of vehicles towards shared resources so lalun lalun sa parking spaces uh, pero depende rin po yan ano kung anong type ng NMS yung gagawin or shared mobility um, uh, lalun na yung nakita natin again in terms of the the ride hailing ride sharing types of models baka iba rin po yung epekto sa ating uh, sistema. Um, in terms of uh, air pollutant greenhouse gas emissions, again, theoretically, mas maganda siya, lalo na kung electric, we don't have uh, direct uh, pit tailpipe emissions. Um, if, uh, malaki yung advantage ng ating maliliit na electric vehicles in terms of actual uh, CO2 and also wala siyang tailpipe directly. So, um, but again, maximizing these in terms of um, assisting the modal shift shift to, to, to public transportation, to our mass public transportation, and uh, as well as uh, aiding you move away from the mindset of uh, vehicle ownership towards shared resources. Um, yeah, there are some other issues. Panggitin ko lang yung mga deadheading. Uh, deadheading, ito po yung um, additional vehicle activity, for example, na walang, wala namang laman. Nyari yung pag-ikot ng mga ride uh, hailing services just to, to, to you know, uh, in standby for, for, for passengers. And in some cases, for example, yung pinakita ko kanina yung, yung e-bike sharing systems na yung sa redistribution um, depende kung ano yung gagamitin na sasakyan. Yung mga van, for example, ano ba yun? Parang diesel vans ba yun? Or trucks na uh, potentially uh, baka in overall makadagdag din sa emissions. Ano? Uh, mode shifts uh, again um, the 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 impacts could be you know uh, could differ so I just took some examples in in terms of how some of these things or some of the shared services can actually take away um, trips uh, from other modes of transport and in some cases they could actually take away significantly from from uh, public uh, public transport as well as walking and cycling so depend again po sa how these are being integrated uh, very similarly sa bike sharing, ganun din yung ating main points. Um, it could actually take away yung gusto natin mangyari to, to assist uh, uh, your, uh, people to use more public transport. It might not be the case in certain cases kasi baka directly mas, mas mag-take away pa sila ng, ng, uh, ng trips. Um, overall resources depend on uh, overall uh, um, supply and demand considerations. But again, I just wanted to to um, point this out now, there have, in, in the recent past, maraming, um, especially in China, there had been a lot of dumping, for example, of um, e-bikes uh, due to different factors. Means and it's just uh, a mismatch between what was envisioned in terms of the demand and what was supplied, for example. But essentially, theoretically, um, we would uh, reduce overall resource um, utilization because of the shared nature of these uh, systems. 
quality of life um, supposedly we can expand the coverage of services uh, transportation services increase overall quality of service and livability uh, again depending on integration uh, but we should be reminded that the direction and the magnitude of the impacts uh, may be different depending on the application um, in terms of access uh, could have the potential for improving overall access to different types of activities and opportunities by complementing um, overall transport networks. But it can also potentially widen the gap, lalo na um, kung i-take into consideration natin yung mga digitally challenged or those population segments that would not have the ability to access the platforms. And uh, maybe in the longer term, yung, yung mindset towards uh, uh, integrating in the uh, longer term planning, um, just to consider that. And in terms of responses, um, I've also talked about some of these things during the presentation the other day, um, but I uh, just wanted to um, highlight again that there are different responses uh, um, that are being taken in terms of um, putting regulations, rules for the users, so age restrictions, helmet use, occupancy, um, yung pina operations bawal mag electronic device or may hawak na package, for example, if you're using uh, electric scooters or your electric uh, uh, bike uh, shared systems. Uh, pwede on the equipment uh, in terms of uh, regulations na dapat standards compliant. Merong accessories. Um, um, merong, yan, yung mga front lights, rear lights, reflector requirements, etc. Uh, it could also be in terms of uh, operations. So where, where do you, uh, where, when, and how do you use uh, the, the devices? Um, so basic concepts dapat, you know, pedestrian safety first, uh, um, and then you consider, depending on su situation, uh, whether it should be operated, you know, where in, in, in the network, or do you provide separate lanes for these things? Um, and also in terms of parking, uh, basic rules, wala dapat obstruction, walang encroachment uh, from the other, uh, especially dun sa priority modes natin, uh, pedestrians and cyclists. Our responses, uh, responsibilities, at so I just took this from um, the uh, city of Brussels because um, what they've done there was to have a mix of uh, um, parang, uh, regulations based and free market type of uh, um, models. But in, in terms of the coordination, this is the thing that they were um, um, highlighting that um, they wanted to provide a single point of contact for everything that's um, um, related to, to managing and regulating these types of uh, shared systems. Kasi nga maraming mga emergent na mga uh, issues na lumalabas. So they, they uh, put up this uh, specific coordination body that would handle the inquiries and the dialogues with the different stakeholders and the operators. Um, in terms of data, siguro ang... Uh, um, um, a key highlight lang po dito that uh, the the shared uh, operators, uh, shared mobility operators, sharing mobility operators globally, um, there are several of them which have uh, supported the uh, specific standards and in terms of um, providing um, the data, uh, they support the provision of the data to the local authorities. So, for example, in yung MDS uh, standard, uh, I think micromobility data standard. And then there's also something that's called the general bike feed specifications, GPFS. Uh, uh, um, these things, LGUs or local governments depend po later on in the uh, sa actual regulations. Natin. But hopefully, um, um suggestion po is to, to have this uh, open data standards approach and that uh, anonymized data can be shared directly to the LGUs so that they can use this for better integrating the, the, the shared systems later on and makatulong then for wider planning purposes. So pwede nyo hong hingin yan uh, kung merong lalapit na mga uh, mobility, shared mobility providers. Um, yeah. Okay, very similar message from, from Finland and the United Kingdom. Um, that the data must be shared and um, must adopt open data standards. Um, in terms of integration with mobility plans, in the case of uh, in California, and, and the, the way they, they approach the planning for the uh, shared e-scooter systems, so they were talking to the operators, and they integrated the plans based on the results of their 
um, air quality management or I think not just EI but uh, yung, yung kanilang dispersion studies uh, where they found um, high air pollution parang uh, red zones as well as yung, yung low access zones so yung walang masyadong uh, access yung mga residente towards the nearest public stations those were the the areas that they said to the operators, okay, these are the areas which you should prioritize in terms of putting up your stations. So these are the kinds of uh, kind of integration uh, mechanisms that uh, potentially um, our own LGUs later can also uh, look into um, in terms of uh, uh, proliferating these types of uh, services. Um, meron din pong <clears throat> responses that relates directly to the operators. Uh, Banggitin ko lang yung ilan. So in terms of um, ihingi ng uh, business plan, detailed business plans in terms of the devices, in terms of the payments, in terms of the, the maintenance plans, right away protections, etc. Um, yung iba po nang ihingi ng specific uh, uh, provisions in terms of insurance and indemnification kasi uh, yung, yung malaking issue din yan, yung safety. You know? Sino bang merong uh, pananagutan dun sa mga users? So in some cases, these are um, being um, spelled out in the contracts with the service providers. And the thirdly, but not last, but uh, uh, maintenance of service quality. So maintenance agreements. Uh, compliance to removal requirements kung merong mga uh, devices that would be in certain areas na hindi siya uh, supposed to be nandun. So, uh, kailangan nakalagay yun sa kontrata with the operators. Um, just to put this into uh, um, uh, our ano rin, parang, uh, consciousness, yung, yung pricing, um, there could be some issues in terms of the um, clarity in terms of the pricing, particularly in terms of the the peak hour uh, charges, for example. So um, maybe not, uh, these might not be within the concern of the LGUs, but I just wanted to also mention this. For example, in India, they were able to at least put some guidelines for the for what they call the aggregators uh, of these uh, different types of services. Um, so yun po, siguro in terms of uh, parting insights uh, based on the presentation, um, hopefully, um, I think since majority or, or a lot of these uh, concepts are still emerging within the, uh, the context of the Philippines, hopefully merong magkaroon ng uh, active mechanisms for engaging the LGUs in the discussions. Um, because, um, yeah, um, malaking bagay yung pag-localize kasi nung mga uh, shared services. And it would be good to, to have the LGUs there as well, as, as well as the other stakeholders uh, and the operators as well. Um, again, strive for integrating uh, shared e-mobility services to longer-term planning. Uh, again, complementing public transport, active mobility. And maybe in the in the shorter term, um, if this can be uh, figured out, at least uh, right now in the local transport route planning or in the wider transport and land use plans, strong considerations for shared mobility services uh, operations on local environments. So yung mga LGUs dito pwedeng mag, mag uh, conceptualize ng mga uh, localized rules and where, when, who, how. Um, Ngayong wala pa masyado, but uh, potentially within the near future magpo-proliferate kasi itong mga, mga services na ganito. Um, engage with the incoming shared mobility providers, particularly in terms of data sharing, uh, which hopefully um, some uh, mechanisms can be uh, spelled out for the LGUs and their authority in terms of uh, probably mandating something like this with the operators that would be operating locally. And uh, as mentioned also during the other day, a lot of uh, these procedural financial instruments uh, potentially uh, providing uh, incentives or, or also spelling out some disin disincentives or penalties for you know, certain, um, let's say, risks and violations um, permitting um, or it could be in terms of uh, providing some sort of other uh, support, no? local support. And finally, uh, look into other uh, potential applications to maximize the features of such systems, um, like in, in potential applications in terms of um, supporting urban freight uh, flows, um, lalo na sa, sa atin wala pa masyadong um, concepts aside from the ones that are uh, being implemented by, um, you know, um, ating mga uh, uh, last mile delivery uh, companies right now. But there could be a lot of different uh, concepts as enabled by these uh, 
innovations in technology, in the vehicle technology, digital technologies, and the, the business models. So I think with that, oh, I just wanted to promote uh, this uh, website that we have. Um, we recently announced this, actually this week, um, um, this is a direct product of the uh, Solutions Plus project in coordination with the Global Environment Facility supported the Jeff 7 um, project, Global E-Mobility project that is also being led by our uh, uh, UN Environment Program. Uh, if you can check the website, we have uploaded uh, um, for now, I think more than 100 tools already uh, that you can check out in relation to e-mobility, but we would, yeah, this is just the first stage. So um, we would be constantly updating, up, uh, uploading uh, materials um, into the e-mobility.tools website. So um, yeah, just visit the website and uh, um, let us also know what you what you think the, the, the toolkit there. So maraming salamat po uh, for, for your patience and uh, for your listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alvin. So in his presentation, we saw the different new mobility services emerging where several business models and platforms are involved depending on the trip purpose. We also saw an overview of ride sharing and ride hailing concepts, which for some can cut down the different modes one can take in one trip. Also, there is the e-vehicle sharing concept that we're implementing in Patrick under the Solutions Plus project. In terms of bike sharing, it's good to know that it's getting bigger in Asia. So hopefully this also becomes widespread in the Philippines because this can serve last mile trips. It was also mentioned that mobility services can significantly reduce urban air pollution by eliminating tailpipe emissions. And there is a need to promote these alternative modes to make people shift from driving a car. So for the audience, if you have any questions, just send them through the chat box and we will address them later during the Q&A part of the session. Moving on to the last presentation, which is part three. This will be about enterprises. So for the businesses here, this one's for you. Mr. Edwin Araga, the president of the Electric Vehicle Association of the Philippines is scheduled to present next, but unfortunately he's not able to join us. So we are welcoming back Doc Manny to present on his behalf. Good afternoon again, everyone. So uh, I'll be uh, presenting in behalf of uh, Edmund. Yeah. Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, different electric vehicle specifications first, because uh, this will show you how wide range uh, is av available to electric vehicles right now. And of course, it follows na napakarami rin pwedeng paggamitan nun. Okay. They're going to look at EVs and tourism, EVs and logistics, EVs and field services, EVs and LGUs, and then some key points. Okay. Um, so these are the different types of uh, electric vehicles that we have right now. So we have the electric mobility scooters. So these are vehicles that are uh, specifically designed for the disabled or for the, for the aged. Uh, so yun talaga yung gamit nila. But, but of, of course, we see them around na ginagamit pamalengke or, or ginagamit ng, ng adult uh, na, na able naman. Okay? So uh, sabi nga nila, it's fun in the Philippines. So kahit ano ginagamit sa kahit saan. Okay. The next is you have a category L1 and category L2 um, <clears throat> vehicles. Uh, category L1A and then category uh, L1, L1B. And then you have category, um, yeah, L1A and then L1B. So okay, these are light, uh, light electric uh, vehicles. Uh, L1A, these are, um, these are, these are um, um, two wheelers. L1B, these are, these are three wheelers. With maximum speeds of around 50 uh, 25 kilometers per, per hour. So medyo mabagal, medyo maliit, but we see them all around. Uh, kinagamit pa tayo, pangatid ng mga anak, pamalengke. Okay. Then we have L2B. Okay, this, this, um, this is a bigger version of uh, L1B and L1A. Yeah. And um, mas, mas 4D lang siya kumpara, kumpara doon sa dalawa. And then uh, we have also L3, which is the normal motorcycle. Uh, the maximum speed is around 50 kph. Um, 
So this is, unlike L1A, L1B, where in medyo mababa yung speed, kaya this one is mas mapulis yung speed niya. Mas, uh, mas malaki siya. Ito yung mga dapat kinagamit for, for deliveries. And then we have L4. Okay, L4 is an electric bicycle actually, pero may sidecar. Then you have L5, which, which is the symmetrical type of a of, of bicycle. Then you have L6, these are quad cycle, quadricycles. Smaller ones, around up to four, four kilowatts in motor. While L7, these are bigger quadricycles, but a lot smaller than the normal car. And then um, you have uh, L6 and L7, their uh, max speeds are both limited to 50 kph. If you go beyond 50 kph and it's for passenger use, then they're classified as category M. So the, um, the electric chip that we know, okay, that's category M. Okay, the normal uh, passenger cars that we know, those are category M. And category M, these are vehicles for, for goods transport and uh, for, for, for other um, utility applications. So they're considered as category M. And then, of course, lastly, we have the, we have the electric buses. So as you will see in here, napakarami. So it means there's, there's electric vehicles is beyond public transport. Personal use, corporate use. Um, we're now all, all, all they're now present in almost all, all uh, vehicle, uh, vehicle types. Okay, very common sa atin right now in category L1A, category 1B, and category 2B. So I think kahit saan kayo umigod right now, nakikita niyan. No? So marami mga China-made mod units right now na nagbilipa na. And uh, it's very uh, very cheap. So maraming bumibili sa, sa kanila. Now, uh, electric vehicles and tourism. Okay, so you will see in there actually on, on your left, uh, yung picture ni Edmond Araga. Okay, the one in blue na naka, naka, um, naka sunglasses. Uh, nasa Boracay siya actually ngayon. Kaya, hindi, kaya, kaya he's not the one presenting this. Uh, he's in Boracay right now uh, together with, with Nissan Philippines to launch Nissan Leaf for, for, for hotels there for tourism use. So um, electric vehicles, electric cars, are now slowly go going into tourism right now also. Uh, slowly going into hotels as a luxury uh, luxury uh, car services. So um, it's, it's now penetrating the tour, the tour agency, the tourism, uh, the tourism uh, industry. On, on the upper right, okay, this is also being done here in the Philippines. You have like a golf cart-like vehicles, electric vehicles that are used for for uh for tours, uh for slow moving tours, no. So yeah, so that is also very very common. And of course, um, in other countries we still don't have one in here. Uh, electric vehicles are also used as shuttle vans. Okay, the nearest that we have is the one of Gets. Okay, however, that is not um it's of a bigger size than okay, than um than this one. So these are the type of vehicles that are used for tourism. So we have locally. We now have electric cars that are sold in the market. Uh, for the uh, for the um, um, golf carts, we have locally made golf carts that are sold in the that are sold in the market. Of course, you can have the choice always to buy an imported one. But uh, um, if you want to buy an electric van, it's still not available uh, locally. You might have you might have to to uh, to import them. This is electric vehicles and logistics. So from all sizes, you have either pedelec. So you have a pedal assist um, electric bike. That is very common in other countries. The second picture that you have there, that is a, a class L3 motorcycle that is uh, produced by um, K1 of the close friends of EVAP, the president of the, the, president of the Electric Vehicle Association of Malaysia. So the, the, they call this the Eclipse bikes. So these are being used right now by uh, by KFC. So this is uh, through leasing. So the company leases these units to KFC, and then KFC operates them, and and they share with the they share with the with the, with the profit. And um, yeah, the, the one on the bottom left is okay, that is a um, pedelec assisted uh, tricycle. Pedal assisted bicycle. Now that that could be an alternative to the normal electric bicycle that we see, the yellow one. 
um, key for slow moving areas. Of course, being pedelec, that means that you're also reducing your battery size, you're reducing the cost, you're reducing the, the motor size. It's, it's a lot cheaper than the normal, normal uh, electric bicycles. And at the same time, you solve the problem of, uh, of range. And then um, you know, the one below, the white one, okay, that is a, uh, that's an electric van, delivery van, um, a bit bigger than an e-quad. Okay, that is very common also for, for deliveries. It's a lot, it's a bit bigger than, uh, than, than the electric bicycles, a delivery van. And then of course you have the electric van and the uh, electric trucks okay, that is, uh, being used right now by a lot of uh, logistics companies, global logistics companies, DHL, uh, UPS Express, UPS, um, FedEx, they're all using, uh, most of them are, 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 are now starting to use uh, electric vehicles in their, uh, in their fleets. And um, this is an area that is uh, less uh, really focused on, but uh, this after an era where electric vehicles is really very useful, and I think at this point is already uh, uh, mature and uh, economically competitive to to, uh, to look at. Okay, so you have intra logistics. It means these are vehicles okay, being operated within the facility of a of a company. So it could be like um, in the vicinity of a farm or in the vicinity of a, of a factory. Um, the thing with these applications, they're not really that fast. So you don't require really very big motors. The area is pretty much controlled, so you can easily plug them in. Um, and then you can schedule things. So that's why okay, these applications for companies now getting very, uh, at least abroad, is now getting very uh, popular. So, um, but, but LGUs can also, for example, use uh, electric, uh, mini electric trucks for garbage collection, uh, for, for maintenance work. Okay, the, the one that you have in there, the, 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 the one with the green, it's uh, for a um, street uh, cleaning um, device. So you can fit an electric vehicle with a street cleaning device and then it moves around. It does not need to be really fast, so it's, you don't need bigger systems. So that's why it, this type of applications makes electric vehicles very, uh, very, uh, very viable. From what I know, um, uh, Miracle is also now starting to adopt electric vehicles in their uh, service fleets. Um, yeah, they've been uh, they've been sourcing electric vehicles. Their minimum the minimum range that you're looking at is at least 150 kilometers, because their electric vehicles goes out of Metro Manila, because their service area is beyond Metro Manila. So. Yeah, so uh, some some even local companies are now looking at utilizing electric uh, electric vehicles in their in their fleet. Um, but of course, one area really one one application of electric vehicles okay, would be in local government uh, units. But whatever works in corporate corporate work, they also work in 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 LAGUs because the, the the applications the services are basically the same. You need to maintain something. You need to bring goods from one point to another. You have to move around people. So basically the same, but it's a varied set of applications unlike in public transport is only transporting people. But for, for LGUs, for corporate world, it's a varied set of, uh, set of, um, of applications. Um, okay, right now, I'm going to show you a, a short video. This is what we're going to roll out in Pasig City. But this is also something that could, this is designed, uh, the system is designed for, 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 for local government units. But this is easily uh, adaptable for, 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 for the corporate world. Uh, there are some big corporations right now in the Philippines okay, that maintains uh, the, a, a shared fleet. So let's say you have uh, one, company A having several facilities in a city, and of course, uh, it, 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 it requires a varied set of a uh, set of uh, transport needs. So they just maintain a common fleet and then it's like a mini grab. It's a confined grab. Okay, and whenever they need it, they book it and then serve one area, uh, one, one, one facility, and then serve another facility, bring people around, can look at if they can integrate um, movements of people, movements of goods together so to, to serve on cost. Yeah. So this is the, the, the 
the video that we're going to show you basically does that. And this is what we're rolling out in, uh, in Pasig City. So that is a system that monitors your battery, uh, battery um, levels. Uh, the system decides uh, where do you charge, at what and at what, uh, and at what time of the day. Uh, it assigns the services. So so uh, so we're rolling this out, and it's also something in passing. It's also something that could be adopted uh, in some corporate uh, in some corporate settings. Okay, but uh, before I end, just like to uh, bring up a certain uh, key points. Number one, electric vehicle is beyond e chips and e trucks because most of the time we talk about electric vehicles, okay, we're talking about e chips and e trucks, which is not actually the case. Um, and uh, in fact, some of these applications are easier to push, it's like intra logistics. He, it would even be good if Edmund is the one talking here because he's supplying electric. Uh, Electric tricycles, for example, for uh, for uh, um, Euratex, and it's being used to move uh, goods within within the with, with, within the company. So low speed applications, where you don't need really bigger motors, uh, it's it's uh, low speed high port applications. This is where we this is really the regime of a uh, of a uh, of cheap electric uh, cheap electric uh, vehicles. So um, uh, that's, all, that's all from my end. I'd love to answer questions later on. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doc Manny. So he presented the different EV classifications and the EVs available in the country that can be used by business owners for production of their businesses, perhaps for the delivery of goods, for example. In one FGD, I just, I just like to share, we were able to talk to a business owner who's interested in using an EV for their mobile cafe. So there's also some interest from the private sector. It's also an exciting time for PASIG with the development of the EQUAD and the FO EVs with the Solutions Plus project. So thank you for that video. Yeah. So for the next part, we will be joined by Anton C, which is the, who is the chief transport planner and head of the PASIG transport, where his work focuses on improving local transport, and promoting sustainable electric mobility solution. in the Department of Finance, and he has a master's degree in transport economics from the University of Lee. So, hi, Anton. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here today. Um, I'm uh, joining remotely from another venue. Uh, apologize uh, in advance for any connection issues. So, Anton, we have had quite an experience with e-vehicles in our implementation of e-mobility projects in passing. From the integration of e-trikes in the delivery of mail and parcel by Philpost 
The BMAC ejects from the DOE that are being widely used around the city and now with the Solutions Plus project. So just to get the ball rolling, I want to ask for the benefit of our audience. What are the city's challenges in pushing for e-mobility and in ensuring their seamless integration into the existing transport system? Uh, can you share about the city's efforts in streamlining e-mobility and from experience, what are the challenges that or you, do you foresee coming? Yeah, I think uh, very briefly, um, the city faces a number of uh, challenges related to adoption of e-vehicle technology. I think one of the main challenges when it comes to mainstreaming electric vehicle technology in Pasig City is, I think, general unfamiliarity with the technology in the uh, Philippine uh, economy and context. I think while you're seeing quite a lot of private adoption of electric vehicles, uh, we still haven't seen it so much on the, uh, on the business and logistics side. I think um, Doc Manny, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Edmund Araga, and others have uh, uh, definitely made some great efforts in starting uh, the use of like e-vehicles for logistics and public transport purposes. But on the whole, I think uh, we still uh, don't quite have a lot of investment when it comes to e-vehicle supportive infrastructure. Uh, and when I uh, talk about that, I'm talking not just of, not just of the uh, obvious uh, pieces of infrastructure like uh, charging stations, but also uh, infrastructure like uh, safe uh, uh, protected um, bicycle lanes that can also be used by e-vehicles, uh, FLEVs, and pedelecs. I think uh, the um, uh, I think one of the other challenges is that when you try to get uh, uh, electric vehicles more mainstream when it comes to uh, public transport operators in the Philippines that tend not to be uh, very well capitalized, there's also a financial burden for which there um, uh, for which we uh, still need to uh, maybe provide some more assistance to. Uh, to undercapitalized operators in order to make the e-vehicle shift. Thank you. So we also heard in the previous presentations why it's important for cities to undertake measures towards sustainable and environment-friendly mobility, particularly after having heard the emissions inventory presentation for that. So which measures and actors do you think can help drive these changes? Yeah. I think when it comes to provo to promoting more environment friendly mobility, I think one of the uh, clearest ways in which um, local local governments in the Philippines, for instance, can uh, uh, can make big changes is to support uh, lighter mobility and especially light electric mobility. I'm talking mainly here about um, walking and cycling, uh, both of which, uh, when you can when you construct infrastructure that's good for pedestrians and good for cyclists, it tends to be uh, quite greatly allied with the sort of light mobility that electric, vehicle, electric vehicles can provide. I think, uh, as uh, Doc Manny uh, mentioned earlier, uh, when uh, you have electric vehicles, it's good to be able to create spaces where you can have lower powered vehicles, uh, slower vehicles uh, moving in harmony with the city. And I think when you build the kind of infrastructure that's good for cyclists and good for pedestrians, it tends to be good for lighter electric vehicles as well. It's good that you mentioned walking and cycling. So, which points us to our next question. What role do you see e-mobility play naman alongside promoting walking and cycling in the reduction of carbon emissions? Uh, where do you think is the biggest opportunity for vehicle e-vehicles in the country? I, I, I think when it comes to e-vehicles in the country, the sky's the limit, really. I think um, we still have, uh, uh, there's still plenty of potential in, uh, you know, when people um, roll over their fleets, when you have private households and also businesses, I think about uh, purchasing their next vehicle. I think um, what you want to be able to capture is that when you have that conversation about when the uh, next when the next vehicle purchases or fleet purchases are going to be, uh, you want e-vehicles to be part of that solution. For instance, uh, when you're a business and you're thinking about buying delivery trucks, you want people to consider something like uh, like a lighter e-vehicle or a quadricycle instead. Uh, I think you need to be able to provide a good offer that it can give you good value for money. Uh, you can get into tighter historical Philippine uh, neighborhoods and streets. And I think uh, really there's a, uh, so much that e-vehicles can do in terms of providing transportation that's not only climate friendly, but also uh, friendly in terms of reducing air pollution, reducing tailpipe pollution, and even non-exhaust emissions. Okay, so for Pasig City naman, what immediate needs do you see uh, does Pasig have in terms of public transport, shared mobility services, and engagement with enterprises? And in what areas, or sorry, how how can e-mobility adoption be part of the solution to address those needs? Yeah, certainly. I think uh, when you talk about uh, what uh, 
what Pasig City as uh, an LGU in the Philippines uh, is involved in. I think one of the primary um, areas where we operate is uh, providing uh, local transportation through the, um, well, what we call the tricycle business. I think e-vehicles can certainly provide a way for the tricycle business to uh, move forward, to modernize, and to become more environmentally friendly. And uh, of course, um, while we'd like to see more people using uh, electric vehicles for uh, public transportation to tricycles, I think we'd also like to see uh, more businesses in Pasig uh, shift towards e-vehicles instead of conventional uh, internal combustion vehicles, just to be able to become uh, more environmentally friendly. And in order to do that, we recognize that um, Pasig City uh, as an LGU is not only going to have to uh, support that through um, friendly and enabling regulations. I, I think maybe there's space certainly for Philippine LGUs to uh, provide uh, technological and even financial handholding uh, as it may be, uh, as the case uh, may, uh, may necessitate. Okay, so there is a question from the audience. This is from Christina Villaraza of Aru. How could you ensure that these projects go beyond the pilot phase? Because a lot of pilots have started, though so far they're not really expanded for now. Certainly. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I think Tina asks a great question. It's hard, it's very difficult actually uh, to get projects uh, from the pilot phase. I think it's easy to get a pilot going. I think uh, uh, Tina makes a good point that the more difficult part is turning a pilot into a serious and uh, sustained effort that persists beyond political terms. The, uh, I think the key there is to be able to uh, navigate political environments well. I think um, once you've got a pilot project, you want to be able to uh, join hands with civil society, make sure that there is political incentive for elected leaders and for uh, other uh, local politicians to support the project. I think um, here it becomes uh, very beneficial to learn how local um, Sangunian councils work to make sure that you can pass uh, legislation that protects the uh, budget allocation of the project going forward. Uh, expands it beyond the, the beyond the pilot phase if need be. I, I think maybe this is where uh, experts in this field uh, really benefit from working closely with LGUs and also working with civil society to uh, really use political momentum to make sure projects uh, keep going and expand even more. So next, uh, in our in the work that we we are doing, we have been proactive in promoting sustainable mobility through the pro provision of infra such as bike lanes the development of institutional mechanisms and other programs. So are there any plans of creating local policies that would support the city's transition to e-mobility? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think definitely, um, I just mentioned the, um, the need for it. Um, I think it's uh, really important to be able to, uh, to really harness uh, local um, political and regulatory tools to make sure uh, that your transition to e-mobility is shepherded and even sustained. Uh, right now, we're, um, we have uh, uh, our mayor has issued an executive order creating a steering committee uh, directing um, city government agencies to uh, to work together using executive functions to support e-mobility. But eventually, what we would uh, what we've also got in the works is uh, framework legislation at the city level to support e-mobility uh, that hopefully will be passed by the city by the city council uh, to make sure that we do sustain those gains. Yeah, so, kailangan talaga yung support ng council rin, no? from executive support. So in terms of awareness naman on a scale of 1 to 10 with 10 being highly aware, how would you generally rate the level of awareness and perception of different stakeholders towards EVs and e-mobility adoption? Yeah. I think the um I think one of the uh I think maybe when you talk about like the perception towards e-mobility, I think um, there's a lot of awareness um, that e-mobility exists. There's a lot of awareness uh, of private e-mobility uh, in that sense. However, uh, I think maybe I would give a, um, a overall rating if I had to just pick one number of maybe six or seven, just because uh, I think people are aware that e-vehicles exist. People are aware that e-vehicles are in the market. But I think um, generally, there isn't uh, so much awareness of the full possibility of their applications. I think right now you see a lot of awareness of the, on the private side, but I don't think there's enough awareness of uh, everything that can make e-vehicles viable uh, for um, the logistics business and for public transportation sense. So I think maybe, uh, yeah, I would say six or seven, just because people may be aware, but they don't understand it well enough to maybe put their money behind it yet. As a follow-up to that, how does the city want to address the lack of awareness, if there's any? 
Yeah, I think uh, this is one thing which we're trying to do through the Solutions Plus project and other programs. I think maybe uh, one thing where um, cities can really lead is to uh, start um, using e-vehicles more, even in city operations, to highlight uh, uses of uh, electric vehicles that go beyond uh, pilots. Uh, you know, I don't want to use the word gimmick, but I think maybe we want to be able to use the, uh, to show that e-vehicles are serious, that they can be used um, for very, many very productive purposes, and that they can be used viably, uh, and not simply as a uh, form of CSR. We want to show that basically that e-vehicles uh, can be used and are uh, and make e economic sense to use beyond just uh, uh, beyond the good feeling you get from uh, choosing a more environmentally friendly solution. Okay, so there's another question from the audience. This is from Mr. Arnold Goofy. Is there already a proposal from the private sector in Pasig for a shared bike and e-scooters? Yeah, um, there have been, um, you know, actually in Pasig at the city level, we get a lot of, um, you, you get a lot of proposals um, to start and or explore shared, uh, shared bike and scooter systems. I think one of the uh, concerns we've encountered, uh, of course, as, in, as an office that inherited a uh, shared bike program uh, when, when our office started, um, that was started by the previous administration. One of the um, concerns we have there is that when you have a shared uh, bike or shared e-scooter program, uh, you realize that you're working with a clientele uh, that, is, uh, that tends to have a lower average skill level than bike commuters that own their own bikes. I think one of the um, key inputs that you need in order to make a shared uh, bike and scooter system succeed is an already uh, developed network of cycling infrastructure. And I think you saw that in places like New York City, where uh, the bike lanes preceded uh, the building of a bike lane network in many parts of New York City preceded their investment in the uh, in city bike, which I think was very successful. Uh, I think we've got, uh, I think in order for that to happen also, you need, you do need a good real estate partnership to ensure uh, good and accessible real estate for all of the stations for the, uh, uh, for the shared bike system. It's something we always have on our radar, but I think maybe in order for it to be really successful, we're going to have to uh, maybe work on some other ingredients to make the whole thing work well. In terms of data collection, Aman, what is the feasible immediate first step for the city? Uh, what kind of data do you think we should be collecting? Yeah, I, I think maybe one thing um, which we definitely need is maybe an ownership survey or, uh, you know, I think we can like speculate on things like awareness of electric vehicles. I think maybe um, one thing uh, that would really help us is like at, is, uh, trying to gauge uh, the actual ownership and sales level of like light electric vehicles in the country. I don't think this is something that's being tracked very well uh, by other government agencies right now. So uh, really trying to learn more about people's attitudes and actual purchase, purchasing behavior towards electric mobility could really help us a lot. Ultimately, what is your vision for e-mobility in the city? So how do you see Passage's role expanding in the promotion and implementation of e-mobility initiatives in the long run. So this includes the short-term, medium-term, and long-term vision and goal. Yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe uh, I don't want to say like strictly short-term or long-term because I want it to be both um, short-term and long-term where uh, when people, it's what I said earlier, when people think about buying their next vehicle, uh, I want, uh, I think my vision would be for people to consider uh, an e-bike, for instance, in addition to a traditional motorcycle or even a car. I think um, definitely uh, what would what I would call a success uh, and would be part of a successful vision is if we uh, successfully make it that people uh, consider e-bikes and e-vehicles e to, to be competitive with internal combustion. I'm not just talking about electric cars and Teslas, but also lighter electric vehicles like e-bikes, uh, pedelecs, because uh, I think there's uh, much more potential for environmental transformation when you talk about uh, people choosing e-bikes when they can choose them over uh, much larger vehicles. I think it makes a lot of environmental sense and I'd really like to see that happen. Okay, thank you so much, Anton. So for our audience, if you have any more questions, you can course it through the chat box. So not just for Anton, but also for our previous speakers as well. Again, thank you so much to our speakers. So I hope this is the start of the expansion of e-mobility, not just in Pasig City, but also in the country. So this goes hand in hand with our efforts to lower our, our emissions from, from using and driving cars. So if there are no more questions, we can proceed with some announcements before closing the session. Okay, so for the survey assessment form and e-certificate of participation, this will be provided upon request. 
So kindly just answer the training survey assessment and indicate if you'd like to have an e-certificate. So this will just take about four minutes of your time. The survey link is also shared in the chat box. So that's a wrap for our four-day PASIG-specific training on e-mobility. Thank you again for joining us in these discussions, and I hope you were able to learn new things and gain insights on e-mobility. So on behalf of the Solutions Plus project, we would like to thank our contributors and speakers for this session. Also, on behalf of Pasig City, we'd like to thank Cleaner Asia and Wuppertal Institute in helping us organize this. We hope to see you in our next set of trainings. And thank you and have a great weekend.